Hello everyone. I'm glad to see you on my channel. The story I'm going to tell you today is pure. It is true that all the bad things that happen in life happen for a reason. It is said that we can appreciate the good things, the things when they happen to us. I hope you enjoy this story. I wish you a pleasant viewing experience. A janitor suddenly arrived with a bucket and helped the teacher from there. A bad groom paves the way for a good one, my grandmother used to say. What does that mean? Frowned 13-year-old Sarah. And that means that if some poor groom appears on the horizon, in a little while you will wait for your real soulmate, explained Grandma Batty with a smile. It's a folk omen. Did you have it like that too? My granddaughter asked curiously. She smiled slyly, and her eyes suddenly became surprisingly young. I remember in the post-war years, there were not many suitors, so Evan decided to hit on me. He was small, ugly, crooked-legged, with a hare's lip and snot running out of his nose all the time. Ah, 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 the girl grimaced. Yep, nodded Grandma with a smile, but my parents said, Betty, don't throw it away. Even though he's a bad one, he's his own. Such a one won't go for a walk. One evening I came to the dance in a new dress, a beautiful red dress with large polka dots and a white lace headscarf, and Evan was walking behind me. Sarah imagined the stately beauty from the old photos walking proudly down the street with the little snotty mess behind her and laughed out loud. My grandmother continued her story, and there were nostalgic notes in her voice. Oh, she was good. Betty shook her head as if thinking of something of her own. That day, the boys from the neighbouring village came to visit, and Evan started bragging about my fiancé. The guys praise and envy Evan, and one of them looks at me seriously. And when I looked at him more closely, I realised, that's him. And then they announced the white dance. So, I was a fool, and I asked them to do it. So what? The granddaughter asked with a smile. What do you mean, what? Thank God, 62 years together and seven children, Betty laughed. So it was Grandpa, gasped Sarah. Who else would it be? The old woman chuckled cheerfully. It just so happened that Evan had led me to the real fiancé. Who knows, if he'd kept quiet, no one would have noticed me. He made it worse for himself. You know, Grams, I kind of feel sorry for him, and for nothing. So Evan found another bride and got married, but he's not very handsome. First the whole village went to our wedding, then to Evan's. That's the story. The grandparents were in their 80s, but neither Betty nor Barry was over 60, or even less. Sarah's father was the youngest son of the couple. Alexander had come into the world when his parents were in their 40s. Both, laughing, said that the secret of their youth was love. What is true, is true. The two elderly people were very reverent towards each other, and the girl sometimes thought that if one of them left this world, the other would not stay in it for long. For as long as Sarah remembered her grandparents, they had almost never parted. Recently, Betty had been in the hospital, and Grandpa had been there day and night. He brought his wife not only pureed soups and fruit, but also bouquets of flowers, Doctors loved this loving, cheerful couple and well envoyed them. Here it is, swan fidelity, thought the attending physician, when he entered the ward and saw a touching picture. Vasily Yakovlevich held his wife's hand and gently stroked it. Sarah, who was also there, felt incredibly proud. The girl often dreamed that she would make a husband as caring as her grandfather. Only with a small correction, Sarah did not want any bad, but his sorters. She, a tonight girl, really wanted to make a love that would be the one and only. After all, that's what happens too, thought Sarah. However, ironically, the omen worked in the case of her granddaughter. In the pedagogical institute, where Sarah and her school friend Angelica entered after school, with grooms were not abundant, one, two and a few, and those were just a few. In a word, nothing. Yes, 
The Pedagogical Institute was definitely not the place to make a cool guy, Angelica said. But who says we can't make him somewhere else? After the first scholarship, the friends decided to go to a bar, where they met some medical students. They chatted about everything in the world and stayed up late. After those parties, Angelica started dating Harry, Sarah with Stephen, but alas, without much love. After a month, it became clear that nothing would come of the relationship. You're wonderful, Sarah said, but I guess fate has prepared you and me for the other half. I'm sorry. Well, I guess you're right, sighed Constantine. He realized that the relationship wasn't working out and there was no point in torturing himself and each other. Hitting acquaintance for company is not the best option at all. If a spark ran between two people, it did not mean that the same thing happened to the others. Good luck to you, Sarah said. You're bound to meet someone who will love you with all her heart. You're really cool, aren't you? I can tell you the same thing, Stephen smiled, and they hugged warmly. That's it. No more dating for dating's sake, the girl decided, watching Stephen until he was out of sight. Sarah remembered her grandmother, who had already passed away a year ago, taking her grandfather with her. The girl was right. Without her adored wife, Barry's life had lost all meaning. After Betty's 40th birthday, her grandfather passed away quietly in his sleep. Betty's soul had left this world, so he was sad. Their neighbor Katie whispered and crossed herself, the kingdom of heaven. So, if you believe the omen, Stephen is the bad fiancé who will lead me to the real one. Thought Sarah, is Stephen a bad guy? No, he's a good guy. He's just not right for us. But grandma never said he had to be bad. Oh, how she missed her grandmother. Sarah would come to grandma Betty's house and they would take their time and discuss matters of the heart over a cup of fragrant tea on raspberry twigs. The grandparents had left Sarah their apartment. The girl entered the inheritance but the apartment has not yet moved in because of the delayed repair. Yes, and dreary there without old people. Relations with her mother were trusting, but unfortunately, Nancy was not up to heart-to-heart -heart talks. Sarah's parents, successful doctors, were always traveling. And now, when she came home sad and wanted to talk, Alexander and Nancy had left for another conference. What are you, like a nun, Rolled his eyes Angelica. Well, you did not work out with Stephen, but life is not over. No, it's not over, Sarah confirmed with a smile. But does that mean I have to throw myself into the arms of the first man I meet? Well, why the first guy you meet? Exclaimed her friend. There are plenty of good-looking guys, but you don't notice them. Maybe that's why I don't notice that there's no one I'd be willing to live with for the rest of my life, Sarah said thoughtfully. You only super duper macho of your dreams do not say that, Angelica giggled, or he'll immediately give a shout. The girl only shrugged her shoulders. Why would I tell him that? If it's fate, he won't run away. I'd look at you, Sarah, and I do not understand whether you still have youthful maximalism has not yet outlived itself, or you have invented an ideal image of yourself. I just don't want to change. Yeah. I ignore guys I'm not interested in. But who does that hurt? Them. Not in my experience, no. Myself. But you have to admit, I'm the only one who knows what's better or worse for me. And sleeping together and breaking up is not for me. Neither is a relationship based on the principle of just to be had. That's the way I was born, and I'm not going to be any different. Yeah, I guess so, Angelica agreed. You're right, I'm sorry. It's nothing, smiled her friend. The five years of her college years flew by in a whirlwind and Sarah's personal life didn't change. She went to parties, honestly tried to look at possible candidates for boyfriends, but alas, tonight girl never met him. Further than innocent flirting relationships with guys did not progress. Well, that's all right, Nancy reassured her daughter. If you're unlucky in love, you'll be lucky in your career. Oh yeah, my mom was good at that. She was a career woman. Still, mom's happy. Don't worry, Nancy smiled, taking her daughter's hand in hers. You'll see, 
We'll have a lot more fun at your wedding. I'm not worried, Sarah replied and smiled too. No, really. Marriage is not an end in itself. I just want to be loved. You will. The ringing of Nancy's cell phone broke the idyll. This is how it always is. The girl thought with disappointment. However, Sarah had no time to dream about a big and bright love. She was more concerned with the question of employment, but fortunately, it was solved rather quickly. A good friend of Nancy's worked as a head teacher at a school that needed an elementary school teacher. The woman put in a good word for Sarah, and on the 1st of September, dressed in a new satin dress the color of virus, went to work. A graduate of the Pedagogical Institute and the first class entrusted to her were new, and it was incredibly exciting. Having listened to horror stories about disrespectful teachers and wild antics of students, Sarah was afraid. There was a class period coming up, and the young professional's knees were trembling. She was wearing high stiletto shoes, and the girl was seriously afraid of falling on the way to class, or right in front of the students. What a laugh, thought Sarah, as if her fall was a done deal. But the fear was in vain. Everything went well. Sarah, you're very pretty, said a pretty, russet-haired girl with a puffy bow on top of her head. Thank you, she smiled. A compliment from one of the mentees cheered her up. Sarah, feeling more confident, said, Guys, parents, stay together. Everybody follow me. My name is Sarah, she said affably, and suddenly to her embarrassment, she realized she didn't know what to say next. But when Sarah saw the smiles of the parents of the first graders, mostly moms, the shame and fear went away. And she continued in a more confident voice, perhaps you have some questions, don't hesitate to ask. The class hour was held in a friendly atmosphere. You are a very nice woman, one of the moms said with a smile and the newly appointed teacher smiled warmly at the young woman. I'll try not to betray your trust, Sarah replied. A meeting with a ceremonial bent was held after the class hour. Dear colleagues, congratulations to everyone on Knowledge Day, said the school principal Selena, a pretty brunette of about 45 years old, with kind, shrewd eyes. Besides, I would like to introduce you to a new employee. Meet Sarah Sarah, please love and welcome. The director gestured lightly at her, and then each staff member said his or her first name and middle name. Sarah felt embarrassed for some reason, and immediately became angry with herself. How much embarrassment can I take? I'm a grown woman, a teacher, after all. She stood up gracefully and looked around the staff with a smile and said, Nice to meet you. I hope we get along well. Sarah took a quick glance around the group and noted the friendly looks, except for two. The first was the evaluating and old oh god, orderly stare of a young man a little older than her, of sturdy athletic build, probably a gym teacher, Sarah guessed, quite handsome by the way. The second look was openly hostile, when she met eyes with a platinum, brightly painted blonde from the same age group, Sarah immediately realized that she had to keep her eyes open otherwise there would be trouble. Her co-workers cheered Sarah up, laughing, joking, and she sat there as if frozen, and all those two, Sarah, not being stupid, instantly realized that the blonde was jealous. Maybe there was something between them, or maybe there was, or the blonde co-worker is counting on it. Who cares? She thought deeply. I came here to work, not to have affairs. So, let the girl sleep in peace. And then the gym teacher furtively winked at Sarah, quite meaningfully, I must say. She definitely turned away, and it didn't escape the blonde, who immediately frowned. What a Santa Barbara! She grinned to herself. And I seem to be at the epicenter of this outrage. After the meeting, the principal invited everyone to the dining room, where a fancy table and a corporate party at midnight awaited the teachers. Thankfully, the next day was Sunday. Sarah got to know all her colleagues and had a drink with some of them. I'm always happy to see new young employees, said a tipsy Selena with a smile. No, really. Unfortunately, 
young specialists willing to work in an ordinary secondary school are very rare today. And you, young, beautiful, and the Institute spoke well of you. That's good. A spect who hasn't even started working yet opens her mouth. Well, nothing. She thought vindictively. We'll say who's who. In war has in war. The teacher's work began. Sarah loved her students, and they reciprocated. The realization that she was sowing reason, goodness, and eternity filled Sarah's soul with pride. She enjoyed the process of learning and loved to go for walks with the class. During one of these outings, Sarah came up with the idea of having a tea party. It was a great way to get to know not only the students, but also their parents. Guys, she called to the class with a smile, come to me everyone. The kids flocked to their favorite teacher in a flash and Sarah suddenly compared herself to a hen's hen. What an association, she teased herself. Guys, I have an idea, Sarah announced solemnly. What's the idea, Sarah? The first graders are chattering away. Why don't we discuss this in class? Nuo, they protested in unison. Well, all right, all right, the teacher gave up. I'll tell you my idea, and then we'll go to class, okay? Yes, the children exclaimed joyfully. They reached the public garden near the school and sat down on the benches next to a long table. In summer, this place was a favorite with school children, students, and local alcoholics. Okay, guys, Sarah started. I'd like to suggest that you have a tea party. We'll bring tea from home and whoever we can cookies, sweets, scones, and have a feast for the whole world. How about that? Great, Anna exclaimed. My mom is going to bake a cake. Such a big, big cake. Chocolate. Well, if your mom has time, of course, Sarah said. She's probably working. Mommy bakes cakes to order, said the girl proudly. They are so beautiful. You've never seen them like this. That would be interesting to see, smiled the class teacher. And my grandmother makes delicious rolls, Vanya Sinitsin said importantly. Better than in the store, really true. Well, that's great. Sarah said approvingly. I'd love to try your grandmother's rolls. And my mom makes scones. And my grandmother, at my mom's. There wasn't much time left before the end of the environmental lesson, which was the purpose of the walk. So Sarah didn't have a chance to listen to everyone. The teacher raised her right hand up and said, guys, I would love to appreciate the culinary talents of your mothers and grandmothers, but we have to get back to school. I'd also need to coordinate with your parents. The first graders went to school without complaint. All the children, except for one student, were in high spirits. Cindy walked behind the rest of the class and frowned. Cindy, why are you so sad? Sarah asked. And I have no one to bake scones or cake. The little girl replied, and her lips trembled. What's the matter? The class teacher asked affectionately. I don't have a mommy, and my grandmother is always busy, the girl sighed. Daddy says that mommy lives in the sky now, but I know she's gone. I don't remember her. Sarah's heart ached. She was good, as a good teacher. She should have seen this coming and stopped her students from bragging. In fact, she had a not very pleasant, but it seemed correct question to herself. Didn't I hurry up with the tea party? After all, the parents of the students could be busy at work. It's one thing for a retired grandmother who can bake rolls all day long and quite another for a tired, exhausted mother. She certainly doesn't have time for baking. Not to mention this poor girl. My poor baby, Sarah said pityingly. Life goes on as an adult, Cindy replied. Yes, of course. After lessons, teachers gathered in the teacher's lounge. The teachers reported to the management about incidents and other costs of a hard-working day of a Russian teacher. Dear colleagues, having gathered her courage, Sarah spoke up. I think I've done something very stupid today. Well, Selena said, tapping her fingers on the table. And what's so stupid? Maybe it's not so bad. I don't know. The girl admitted and told me about her idea. That's a great idea. Victoria said sarcastically. 
She herself, like Sarah, was an elementary school teacher and was not particularly proactive. But it would be a good idea to discuss it with the administration, not with the first graders who were now waiting for the tea party. I thought I said I was having doubts, Sarah replied, glaring at her coworker. And now I'm asking for advice from the team. Actually, the tea party itself isn't a bad idea, the gym teacher said, and was immediately rewarded with a scathing glare from Victoria. Why? It's a great way to bond with the guys. And gain cheap credibility, Victoria venomously interjected. So cheap authority. Maria, the historian, snorted. In Soviet times, tea parties were the norm, and no one thought of cheap authority. That's right, not of the principal. But we should not forget that times change and dictate their own rules. Victoria had mentioned cheap authority, and in a way she was right. After all, it's possible that there will be parents who will think the same thing. And from a financial point of view, have you seen the prices of groceries? So, parents may not feel the same way about this idea as they did before. Sarah blushed deeply and lowered her head, but Victoria's gaze flashed with triumph. But not for long. No, no, Sarah, I don't suspect you of any such thing. The principal hastened to reassure me. I know you acted in good faith. So what now do we cancel the tea party? Sarah asked in a low voice. Well, why not? Selena replied with a kind smile, the children are waiting. It's great that you have ideas, but in the future I would ask you to discuss them with me. And of course, it would be a good idea to consult with your parents. And then you can present them to the students. Yes, of course, smiled the girl. Thank you, Selena. You're welcome, she smiled back. What else is a manual for? You are a new person and you still have a lot to learn. Any other questions? dear colleagues. No one had any questions, and the teachers began to go home. Victoria was furious. Sarah, put on her favorite cream-colored raincoat, slipped into her high, low-heeled boots, and walked out of the teacher's lounge with one last glance in the mirror. Victoria was standing in the hallway, clearly waiting for someone. Did you get off easy, you little pigeon? She asked snidely, blocking Sarah's path. Let me pass, she threw, glaring at Victoria as if she were nothing. She wanted to say something, but John appeared in the hallway. Victoria, forgetting about her rival, went on the offensive. Sarah grinned and went outside. The young teacher walked down the alley, inhaling the spicy scents of autumn and admiring the bright colors of the season. Sarah, she heard it. Turning around, the girl saw the gym teacher, John was running toward her, not walking, but running. God, what does he want from me? Sarah thought wistfully. This wouldn't happen to be yours, would it? John asked and pulled a chiffon scarf out of his pocket. Mine, she said, embarrassed. How did I do that? The wind blew it away, my colleague smiled. I saw it with my own eyes and shouted at you for 10 minutes. And you didn't respond. Yeah, I guess so, nodded Sarah. I was just thinking, yeah, thank you. How about a kiss? The girl gave John a look that made him shiver and he hurriedly raised his hands in surrender. A joke, he said. However, I am quite serious about walking you home. Aren't you afraid? Grinned Sarah. What? Or who? Do we have a jealous husband? No, she shook her head. No jealous husband, but I'd seen enough jealous friends in three weeks. You mean Victoria? Well, who else? Or is there another friend at school? That's up to you. John replied with a hint of innuendo. Sarah, I'm not going to bait around the bush. I like you very much, and I don't need to hide it. As for Victoria, I didn't swear my love to her, and I didn't promise her anything. If she's making up stuff for herself, that's not my problem. Anyway, I'm very hungry, and there's a small but cozy cafe nearby. It's almost a restaurant. Well then go to your cafe restaurant, snickered Sarah, and I should get home. Is your husband waiting for you? John asked, and then answered himself in the affirmative. Of course he is. People like you, everything is just as it should be. First the studies, 
then marriage to a long-time boyfriend, and not because of love, but because it's the way it should be. Well, and then delicious, nutritious, and of course, healthy breakfast in the morning, borscht, cutlets, picnics on weekends. Sarah was suddenly amused by this conversation, and she added with a chuckle, you forgot the swaddling clothes. No, I haven't forgotten. The gym teacher shook his head with a smile. I just don't think it's come to that yet. You're obviously not the kind of person who jumps out of a marriage as a student and goes on sabbatical due to an impending addition to the family. Everything's under control. Everything's on track. You seemed hungry, remarked Sarah. So enjoy your meal and have a good weekend. Sarah rode in the shuttle bus and digested John's inferences. He really believes what he said, she thought. Some people think they're great psychologists, but I wonder where he gets his conclusions from. When the next day Sarah told Angelica, who had been lucky enough to get a teaching job at a prestigious high school, she shrugged her shoulders. And you know, there's nothing surprising about it. The friend gave her verdict. Why is that? Sarah wondered because you look like this super right, beautiful smarty pants who has her life planned out to the minute. I have nothing planned, she sighed, school home, school home. So your gym teacher flattered you a lot, Angelica grinned, but otherwise he was right. By the way, do you like him even a little? Angelica, okay, I see. What am I talking about? Let's keep talking. You have that I'm so predictable, and my life is just like that look on your face. Is that a bad thing? Ah, uh, no. But you know, you could use a little pepper. Sarah, but you're supposed to be young and have a lot to remember. What are you gonna remember? Work. Sarah couldn't find anything to say, and Angelica took advantage of her confusion and said, All right, we're going to the biker club tonight. No objections. Where to wear? Sarah was stunned. To the biker club, Angelica eagerly repeated, it's really cool there. But it's not like I'm a biker. So did I. So there are such awesome parties and photo shoots there. And there's a photo shoot there today, winked a friend. Sarah stared at her friend in amazement, opening and closing her mouth, reminding her of a beached fish. And what are we looking at? Angelica grinned, and looked at her watch. We still have time to go to Stiliaga for a leather outfit. Where am I gonna get the money for a leather outfit? Okay, eco leather is even more spectacular. Like, ah, uh, tight tights. Well, what do you want? You can't go in a teacher's outfit. Maybe we shouldn't. Sarah made a timid attempt to dissociate herself from this madness. We must, we must. Angelica said resolutely, Shall we go to Stiliaga? Let's go, Sarah nodded dejectedly and thought, what the hell? When you think about it, I really don't have anything to remember. And I'm already 23. Mmm, sweet, exclaimed Angelica, looking at her friend, dressed in a stylish kosuba and a short, slightly flared skirt made of eco-leather, decorated with deceptive locks imitating pockets. The biker look was completed with boot boots and tights with a mesh pattern. Wasn't that a little bold? Sarah asked apprehensively. What's with the habit of shitting all over the raspberries? It's great, and don't argue. Mother, Nancy exclaimed in amazement when she saw her daughter dressed like a biker's girlfriend. Where do you think you're going? And we, Aunt Nancy, are going to a biker club, replied Angelica cheerfully. The woman's eyebrows slowly but surely cracked upward. Her homebody daughter was going to a biker club. It's unbelievable. Mom, don't you like it? Sarah asked, secretly hoping her parent didn't approve of her new look. You don't like it? Mother marveled. I've always wanted you to wear something like that. Sarah, it's cool. Really? She asked incredulously and looked at her mother carefully, thinking she had been drinking but it was nothing of the sort. Well, not? Angelica said admonishingly, you must obey your mother. Sarah only shook her head, deciding that what was happening was akin to mass insanity. Did her mom like the way she was dressed? Holy shit, 
It was Kafka all over again. The friends took a cab to a garage on the outskirts of town, and Angelica told the driver, Okay, now turn right and all the way to the end. They pulled up in front of what looked like an auto repair shop or a basement, more like the second, Sarah summarized. When the girls paid the cab driver, Angelica led her friend down the stairs and finally pressed the call button. Who is knocking at my door? A male voice with a Caucasian accent was heard. They are their own, Angelica said with a laugh, and the door swung open, making Sarah hurriedly jump aside. The girls entered the room, and a handsome, tall, blonde man, who had nothing to do with Caucasian nationality, came out to meet them, nor did he have anything to do with Caucasians. I, Cindy, the blonde smiled. I, Chippy, Angelica greeted him, after which they hugged each other hurtily. At least introduce her to her girlfriend, the guy said jokingly. My friend's name is Sarah, no pseudonym yet due to my forgetfulness. A pseudonym of some sort, she thought perplexedly. Kindergarten. Chippy, the blonde man introduced himself, bowing slightly to Sarah. Pleasure, the girl said hesitantly, and Angelica drew her away, dropping her. Chippy, we'll talk again. The friends walked on. The club had a bar, billiards, and even a nice sauna with a swimming pool. How do you like it here? Angelica asked. I don't know yet, Sarah admitted, but it's atmospheric. What's behind the curtain? And this is kind of like a photo booth. Then we'll take a picture of you in front of some cooler iron horse. Angelica introduced Sarah to the new inhabitants of the club, who appeared like mushrooms after the rain. Sarah was introduced to the club's new inhabitants, who appeared from somewhere like mushrooms after the rain. How do you memorize them all? Sarah muttered. Don't worry about it, snorted her friend. Of course, you won't be able to remember anyone the first time, but you don't have to. Everything will be remembered later. There were not only young guys and girls here, but also older men, as Angelica whispered respectfully, old school bikers that were all smiling, and Sarah realized that it was really nice to be here. The doorbell rang. Sarah couldn't believe her eyes when she saw the newcomer, a group of five tough guys. Angelica, pinch me. She muttered shocked. What is it? But Sarah was speechless, and with good reason. Because one of the big guys was none other than John, Sarah's co-worker. In person? Yeah. When she finally found the ability to speak intelligibly and told her friend about it, she laughed. What is it? Sarah repeated her friend's question. Because my star, he was hitting on me too. Why am I not surprised? Well, why are you? It's okay. She waved her hand. I've never been attracted to the prospect of being one of many. And I told him as much. Besides, I have a tender love affair with Chippy. So you're with him. Yeah, well, what's the big deal? But you're a educator, Sarah replied with a slight hesitation. I'm begging you. Sarah, have you fallen off the moon? I'm a teacher, yes, I'm a teacher, but not a nun, right? And in general, I am a teacher at my lyceum, and here I am a young, cool girl. Like you, by the way. I don't know. Seeing John walking toward them, Sarah tensed. Calm down, old lady, Angelica said encouragingly, this is the fun part. Sarah didn't feel that way. In fact, she suddenly wanted to get the hell out of here, as soon as possible. She'd had enough excitement, not all at once. I, John said, looking at Sarah appraisingly. I, Angelica smiled. Are you with a friend tonight? Introduce me. She shrugged and Sarah realized that John hadn't recognized her. That was what made her feel like the boss of the situation. Mmm, that felt pretty damn good. Do we really know each other? He turned to Sarah, smiling through all 32 teeth. Well, of course, she smiled. John, what's the matter with you? I'm Sarah, your colleague, the one you wanted to invite to the cafe just yesterday. Sarah, the PA teacher asked in amazement, gazing into her face. Well, yeah, well, yeah, just, um, makeup, well, and stuff. 
John was funny to look at. I just don't know why he was so confused. Was it because he didn't recognize Sarah? Or was it the fact that she had come here at all? Or maybe John wasn't used to seeing a co-worker in such informal attire. Probably altogether, Sarah suggested. But she seemed to be wrong. Sarah, you're amazing, John purred, pulling himself together. But you know, guys, there's a uh, girl coming over here right now. No, don't get me wrong. It's nothing serious. She's the one who thinks we're a couple. It's okay. It happens. Sarah replied condescendingly. It's a mundane matter, Angelica added mockingly. Yeah, John nodded, and then his cell phone rang. Apologizing to his girlfriends, the hapless Boaz stepped aside and started the conversation. Judging by his smile, it was a pleasant one. What was that? Angelica laughed as the girls moved a respectful distance away. Apparently, our shooter wants to keep up with everything. Sarah shrugged with a smile. Looks like it. My mood suddenly lifted, and there was no trace of the desire to leave this place as soon as possible. Len, did you say something about a pavilion for a photo shoot? She smiled, but is it realistic to take a picture now? You bet. The girlfriends were filmed against a backdrop of motorcycles, a brick wall, a curtain, alone, alone, in the arms of the most beautiful and brutal bikers. Sarah enjoyed herself immensely. And then there was the sauna, the pool, and soulful lounging at the bar. John, who, as it turned out, was known as Jenny, was nowhere to be found. The girls didn't want his company at all. It was after midnight when we got home. Did you like it? Angelica asked, no longer doubting the answer. Very much so. Oh, and you didn't want to go. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Well, I like this girl. Confessed John to his best friend Tony, but so foolishly screwed up. John loved the biker club. It was almost the only place in the world where he could be himself to the fullest. That is, not as a teacher, but as a tough guy who could not resist any girl. In the club it was possible to seduce an unburdened pretty girl and have a great time. But this time, as they say, something went wrong. But who would have thought that the woman John had been dreaming about for three weeks would be there? And he had a date with someone else. In fact, John could have sent the lady away and taken care of Sarah away from the staff. But the club doesn't honor that kind of behavior. As a result, the amorous gym teacher had a good time and now he could not rest. What will Sarah think of me? And anyway, how to win her over? What's the big deal? Tony shrugged perplexedly. Well, you were hitting on her friend. There was nothing going on between you two. So you went out with someone else and, well, what's she gonna think of me? She won't think anything special. It's exactly what it is. John's a real piece of work. Why? A walker means he's in demand. I'm afraid it's not something that can entice our Sarah with an ironic smile shook his head that still Walker, to me her friend that in our party Cindy, gave out that she is not interested in being one of many. She's a liberated girl though, and with Sarah, there's no chance. Tony whistled. I don't recognize you, buddy. You haven't actually made any serious attempts to win this, ah, Sarah of yours, and you're already ready to give up. Where's your ingenuity? And is that even you? I do, John sighed, but I guess I've been easy prey so far, and considering my friend, too easy. Teachers, the friend waved his hands, but, but, but. John jokingly wagged his finger. Aren't you saying that all teachers are prudes? By the way, your humble servant, if you remember, is also a teacher. Well, think of Victoria. Didn't take much convincing there. Ha, huh, you compared to. She's in love with you like a cat. You don't count either. We men are all womanizers, some more than others, some less, whether you're a teacher or a tractor driver. Well, and women teachers are not that prudes, but in short, here you need a special approach. I know that without you, John said with a sigh, but the question is, how do I find him? You'd have to know her weaknesses at the very least. Good thinking, Tony nodded approvingly. 
Well, it's gonna take time to learn all this stuff, isn't it? Are you in a hurry? Said his friend with a chuckle. What a way to put it. You know what happens. I like a girl, and I think she's special. She dynamites you, and that only makes it worse. Well, if she's special, you're willing to wait as long as you want. And now, you've finally waited. You splurge. You give her a big romance, but you feel nothing but disappointment. You know why? Because it turns out she's not special at all. No, it's much simpler than that. Tony muttered slowly, there's just no chemistry. Not your girl, that's all. Who the hell is special? We're all ordinary homo sapiens. Just each of us with our own weaknesses. And weaknesses can be played on. But if you're so desperate, I can tell you a universal way. Now, 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 don't be long. John was intrigued. Women have always loved a hero, so be one. Oh yeah, how am I supposed to become one? Well, how? Tony furrowed his brow, like saving your girlfriend in an extreme situation. In what other extreme situation? Snorted John skeptically. I might as well wait for Sarah to mature and there's still no telling what will happen ahead. So create that situation and be done with it. I don't mean pull her out of a burning house or rescue her when she's drowning. But saving her from bullies is very realistic. Hmm, John said thoughtfully. There's something about that. And I think I even know how to do it. Sarah had never liked Mondays. She was one of the people for whom that day of the week was really hard. When Sarah was at school and then at the institute, she would come home tired and exhausted and immediately go to bed. The lethargy receded by evening, but the feeling that she was unloading railcars did not leave Sarah until Tuesday morning. This Monday promised to be doubly hard, but strangely enough, the girl felt invigorated and rested. It turned out that she could be different too. It gave Sarah more energy than any energy drinker. The young teacher had to ask in the parent chat room what moms and dads thought about organizing a tea party. Since Friday night, Sarah had repeatedly picked up her smartphone and tried to write, but each time she deleted the message and hated herself. She understood, of course, when the task was over, it was easier, but she couldn't help it. It was easy on its own. But when Sarah thought of the director's words, she felt uneasy. And on Monday, on her way to school, a simple but true thought occurred to her. Why am I agonizing? It's up to me to offer, and then it's up to me. They won't hit me in the forehead. Sarah, when is the tea party? Vanya Sinitsin asked, as soon as she entered the classroom. This question is being solved, the girl smiled, and when the first graders were busy writing, she took a gadget and typed the pressing question lightning fast. For 30 minutes, no one answered, Sarah put her phone on silent mode and forgot about the chat, so she wouldn't be nervous. When the call rang, she started to look through the messages and was pleasantly surprised. Her parents loved her idea. Cool idea, wrote Samanda. The message was followed by several different emoticons. Why didn't you offer right away? Selena, Anna's mother, was puzzled, judging by the smiley face. I bake cakes to order but for such an occasion, I'm ready to treat everyone for free. I, though the man, will gladly contribute as much as I can to a good cause, assured Mickey. Sarah remembered Cindy's sad eyes as the children talked excitedly about their mother's and grandmother's culinary talents. Then she told her that her mom was gone. Sarah clicked on Mickey's profile and saw a young man with kind eyes and a slightly sad smile. It's easier to get over the loss of mom with a father like that, she thought, though of course no one can replace mom. Waking up from her thoughts, Sarah wrote, very good. Let's discuss this matter in more detail. Maybe we should get together at a time that is convenient for you. In the end, they agreed to meet on Wednesday. The negotiations went well, and on Thursday morning, Sarah solemnly announced to the first graders that on Saturday at 12 o'clock, everyone was invited to a tea party. Yay, the children shouted. After listening to the words of gratitude after the tea party, 
Sarah decided that it was not worth stopping. She was sure to come up with something new and no less interesting for her students. The young teacher had no idea what passions were playing out around her. Selena was making a work plan for October. I think I should take a little break, she thought, her mind racing. The kettle boiled and the principal went to the cupboard. It seemed that there were some quite edible croissants left over from yesterday. There was a knock at the door. Come in, replied the director with a note of doom. Victoria, an elementary school teacher, stood on the doorstep. Selena, do you have a moment? She asked in a begrudging way. The principal sighed. Frankly, she didn't like this person. Slippery, vulgar. But a good manager shouldn't show his personal attitude to his subordinate. Yes, of course, Celine spoke coldly, listening to you. I wanted to ask you, how do you feel about that new elementary school teacher? Sarah, the principal clarified. Yes to her. Selena frowned. Oh, this visit was not a good thing. But since the question had already been asked, it had to be answered. And so she answered it. Well, how I feel about her is irrelevant. But since it's so important to you, I think Sarah's a good girl. And she'll make a great teacher in time. Is that it? Well, I don't know how to tell you this. As it is, say so. The director shrugged and added, no longer trying to hide her irritation, Victoria, I really don't have much time. So if you really have something to say, say it. If you don't, you can close the door on the backside. I was going to say that Sarah was flirting with the gym teacher, Victoria blurted out, but that's unacceptable, wouldn't you agree? Really? Grinned the director, I have a completely different piece of information. Yeah, but uh, but... Also, the tea party is. Victoria suddenly felt like a schoolgirl who had come to tell on a classmate and she was angry with herself. She regretted coming here, but there was no retreat. What did the tea party have to do with it? Selena asked perplexed. She knew exactly what this poisonous, and as it turned out, jealous lady had in mind, but to use the leadership in her intrigues, no. That was out of line. He who wants results allows means. Salim mentally quoted the classic. And in love and war, all means are good. But is it love or war? I think it's the latter. But maybe I can prevent a war. I'll tell you what, Victoria, said the principal tiredly. It's not right for a teacher to gossip like an old woman, let alone try to involve me in it. It's low and immoral. Well, morality is not for you and it seems that you judge others from your own bell tower too. But I'm not at all. I'm not done yet. She raised her hand. You want to outdo Sarah? Go for it. At least organize the same tea party. I'll let you in on a secret. The parents loved it. Children need to be socialized, and you, as a teacher, should understand that. And another thing. It's not my policy to single anyone out. But if I find out that you're poisoning this, girl, I'll give you a life. Any questions? No, Victoria muttered dejectedly. That's fine. Go to work. After the teacher left the room, Selene immediately felt like using an air freshener. This is so gross. And such people go to work in schools, the woman thought sadly. For what? And what did she expect when she came to me? Victoria's visit threw the director off balance, but Selena Vladingarovna had a work plan waiting for her. A couple of hours later, another conversation about Sarah took place in the school, but it wasn't as emotional, but it was more savory. John and three other 11th graders who were friendly with him were drinking in the gym teacher's office. Actually, they could get a lot of trouble for that kind of misbehavior, but if you did it smartly, it would all be covered. The boys won't tell anyone, and the principal left an hour ago. John checked it out himself. Guys, we got a case, he started talking. A delicate one. Delicate? Arthur asked curiously. And how delicate, inquired Tom. I'm going to give you the gist of it. John said in a business-like manner, and you can judge for yourself how delicate it is. Anyway, I like the new elementary school teacher. 
I approach her this way and that, but she doesn't notice me. Yeah, Arthur said. Well, what do we have to do? I want to look like a hero in her eyes, and you're going to help me with that, the gym teacher smiled. John's plan was as follows. His high school friends lure Sarah into the locker room and start hitting on her. Well, like a true gentleman, he saves the lady of his heart. Naturally, I owe you one, John summarized. I'm not going to do that. Nicholas, who had been silent until now, exclaimed, Is it okay if it's attempted rape? And that's a criminal offence. I don't want to start my adult life in jail. Indeed, John, Arthur agreed with his comrade. You've gone a little overboard. It's going to be fine. John said with conviction, it only seems risky at first glance. There's no risk at all. Yes, Tom grinned incredulously. We don't think so. Maybe we don't understand something though. That's just it. John was eager to confirm. First of all, you don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything for one thing. You don't have to do anything. Favorite girl, Nicholas grinned. Well, you don't have to tell us. The main thing is that there won't be any action on your part. And then, it's unlikely that Sarah will give this case a go. Think about it, does she need to? She's been working here a week, and it's not like her to embarrass herself like this. I mean, the gossip's gonna start. Oh, and Victoria's bound to chime in, he thought with a chuckle. But John didn't even realize that the most interesting part of their conversation had been overheard and even recorded. The conversation with the principal had thrown in both parties off balance. The teachers left the teacher's room, but Victoria remained seated, staring at one point. Alas, the conversation with the principal had not produced the result she had hoped for. I've had happiness thrust upon my head, resented Victoria, it's either me or her. Except what to do? Victoria looked at her watch, took a deep breath, changed her shoes, and took her coat off the coat rack. She left the teacher's lounge, but when she heard voices from the direction of the gym, she headed that way. No other way than with her, thought Victoria in a rage, and trying not to clack her heels, snuck to the door of her lover's office. I'm going to sketch the gist of it now. She heard John's voice, and how delicate, judge for yourself. Anyway, I like my new elementary school teacher. I approach her this way and that, but she doesn't notice me. No, not with her, Victoria rejoiced. There's obviously something more interesting going on here. Holding her breath, she pulled out her smartphone and turned on the recorder, and just in time. John outlined his plan, and there was a brief pause. I won't sign up for that. The silence was broken by the voice of one of the seniors, whom Victoria called his henchman. Is it okay if it's attempted rape? And that's a felony. The scheming teacher just couldn't believe her luck. Victoria didn't know what to do with the tape, but she felt it would serve her well. The main thing was to think it over carefully. I like her, one of the guys said in a playful voice. Such a cute little baby girl, I love them. Ah, 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 keep it down. There came John's warning voice, it's mine. Victoria clenched her fists, completely unable to feel her sharp nails digging into her skin. Well, let's say we agree, said one of the guys. Let's say, but how do we do it? How do we get that Sarah of yours into the locker room? The fall prom is in a week, and Sarah will be the teacher on duty that week. One of you will call her into the locker room to say something's wrong, and then the next thing you know. Deciding that was enough, the schema walked out of the gym. Victoria took a perfumed bath and wondered what she should do with the tape. The teacher was honestly trying to figure out what she wanted to do to weaken a hated rival or to prevent John from such dubious heroism. Both, Victoria thought. Why? She could hold John off, the boys could do their thing. Youth, hormones and Sarah, by the way, is pretty and fresh. The seniors can't resist, and then Sarah's gonna be embarrassed. There's nothing left for her to do but resign. How about we make it look like she wanted it to happen? John wouldn't admit he put the guys up to it, or he'd be in trouble, 
Victoria thought. But no, that's a fantasy. I don't think anyone's going to believe it. The other option was to let Sarah listen to the tape. Or better yet, threaten John that she would do it. But after a second, Victoria rejected both. In the first case, Sarah would undoubtedly be grateful to her. But Victoria didn't need her gratitude any more than a fish needs an umbrella. Well, by blackmailing John, Victoria would make an enemy, that's all. Screw it, she thought, drying herself off with a big fluffy towel. I'll act on circumstances. The autumn ball was always eagerly awaited. It was a large-scale event, which, like the New Year's tree, was organized in three streams for elementary school, middle school, and high school students. The next week promised to be a busy one. Sarah had to be the teacher on duty, which I think I can handle it, Sarah replied. That's fine, nodded the vice principal and winked at her. Yes, smiled the girl. The fall ball was scheduled for six o'clock in the evening. At 1745, the hall and the corridor were crowded with dressed up teachers and school children. Both were chatting merrily in anticipation of a fun celebration. Many took pictures. Duty is duty. But on the occasion of the fall ball, Sarah had bought a chic outfit, a coffee and milk colored tea pantsuit. The elegant suit beautifully set off her brown eyes and hair the color of ripe weight, gathered in a high intricate hairstyle. Flesh colored shoes on a massive platform and stiletto heels made the girl taller. What can I say? She was good. You look great, complimented John. You should be on the cover of a fashion magazine, not a party girl. Is it just me, or are his eyes rumming strangely? Thought Sarah, feeling a slight prick of misgiving. She tried to chase the bad thoughts away, but she wasn't very good at it. Eh, I seem to be getting paranoid, the duty teacher stated ironically. Well, what could possibly go wrong? The concert was very interesting, and Sarah, forgetting her misgivings, laughed at the funny numbers, applauded the artists heartily, and encouraged them. A tall, handsome boy came up to her. He seemed to be in the 11th grade. Excuse me, are you the teacher on duty? The guy asked. Yes, nodded Sarah. Is something wrong? You could say that. Over there by the locker room. Ah, yeah, sure. I'll be right back. She reached the locker room, but seeing nothing suspicious, she looked questioningly at the guy. What's the matter? Sarah asked perplexed beginning to realize that her misgivings had not deceived her. The teacher on duty wanted to go back to the hall, but the boy unceremoniously pushed Sarah into the locker room, where she was horrified to find two more men. One of them had closed the locker room from the inside. What do you want from me? The girl asked fearfully. It wasn't hard to guess, but Sarah refused to believe it. Not here, where anyone could have entered. The guys didn't say anything back, just sniffled and pulled their hands toward her, pushing each other away. The guys smelled strongly of perfume, but even that didn't overpower the alcoholic odor. That makes sense, Sarah thought. They're drunk, so they've got the urge to do something. The girl broke free of the disgusting embrace and screamed as loud as she could. Help. One of the guys made an attempt to clamp the girl's mouth shut but the wrong guy attacked. Sarah bit him and shoved him away sharply. You scum, hissed the high school student. Well, now I'll count all your teeth. Help, screamed Sarah again at the top of her voice. Julia, the school janitor, didn't like holidays. The shouting, the noise, the noise, the noise, and then you have to clean up after them. It was no secret to the old woman that the students and quite well-behaved looking female students were not averse to having a beer, wine, or even something stronger in a secluded corner. It was a young thing, of course, but the prospect of cleaning up their vomit didn't appeal to them. But this time, it looks like something really out of the ordinary happened. It's not every day you hear cries for help, not on school grounds. So well dozed off, thought Julia grudgingly. The elderly cleaning lady liked to take a nap in the building, waiting for the end of a disco or a teacher's corporate party. But apparently, 
This time, it was not to be. Armed with a mop and bucket just in case, Julia headed toward the locker room, where a woman's scream was coming from. The old woman ran briskly to the hall, and knocking on the locker room, asked sternly, What's going on here? Help, please. She heard a pleading female voice say, and the locker room door swung open. To Julia's amazement, the new elementary school teacher came out. She was sobbing and shamefully covering her torn blouse with her hands and a black eye. Oh my God, exclaimed the old woman, and without thinking long enough, she kicked the first person who came to hand in the head. For what? asked Tom with a hiccup. Not enough, exclaimed the cleaning lady. I would have added more, but now everybody's so gentle. Anything goes straight to complaining. And what are you doing, you wicked? And don't think you'll get away with it. Footsteps were heard from the direction of the assembly hall. The holiday concert went on as usual. John sat closer to the exit and Victoria sat nearby. After a while, the gym teacher left the hall and she followed him. Don't like the concert? Victoria asked with a smile. Why not? Shrugged John. The concert is quite decent. Just a headache. Clearly, Victoria coquettishly mouthed, fixing her hair. Shouting was heard from the direction of the locker room. Victoria, didn't you hear anything? The PA teacher asked. No, she replied nonchalantly. But someone's screaming. John wouldn't give up. What's the dookie teacher for? That's the thing. That's what she's yelling. Oh, come on. Not a little girl, Victoria pointed out. Victoria, it's her first time on duty and on a holiday. Sarah's a new person. John exclaimed, you're such a... Unable, apparently, to find the words, the gym teacher strode toward the hall. John, what else? John asked annoyed, don't you realize that Sarah might need help? And anyway, stop hanging on to me. You're cheap. Do you get it? You're cheap. John quickened his pace, but Victoria kept up. What do you want from me? The gym teacher exclaimed, turning around and stabbing her ex-girlfriend in the eye. She arbed and covered her face with her hands. Did you get it? Quit John and staggered onward. Got it, Victoria thought, but he who has the last laugh. And she, anticipating a big show, hurried after John. The gym teacher was in a fighting mood. Well, now he would prove to Sarah that he was a worthwhile option. And then, there she stopped the enemy. Julia proclaimed triumphantly when she saw John and Victoria. John was stunned. When he realized that his plan had failed miserably, the gym teacher slumped helplessly into one of the chairs. I called the police too, the older woman said, and John finally snickered. Victoria looked at him with interest, and it was a truly pathetic sight, isn't it? The gym teacher tried to say something, but didn't finish. The quiet boys stood aside. Law enforcement officers arrived about 15 minutes later. So, what happened? Asked already in the office, courtesy of Selena, the investigator. Sarah and Julia told it like it was. Attempted rape? suggested one of the staff. No, Nicholas exclaimed, we had no intention of, um, raping her. And what were your thoughts then? Asked the investigator, I'd be glad to hear your version. All the more so, guys, you understand? This is a serious matter. The guys understood. So this, we are not ourselves. Hesitantly began Arta Tikhanov. Yes, Tom confirmed. There was a knock at the door. May I? Victoria asked, I have important information about the case. The boys really had nothing to do with it. It's a real mystery. The policeman splashed his hands. Well, not exactly nothing to do with it, the teacher clarified, but, by the way, what happened to your eye? The investigator asked mockingly and added with a chuckle, were you also, ahem, tried to be raped? No, I was not attempted rape replied the teacher, but let's get on with it. I have a tape recording that proves the innocence of these guys. Well, play your tape. Wow, Selena exclaimed, this school is a hot of organized crime. You goo, 
nodded the investigator, will then invite the organizer of the crime. The principal stepped out into the hallway and asked one of the crowd of curious people to get John. And he's nowhere to be found, someone said. Then find it. There was no way for him to leave. An employee was standing at the entrance, the investigator noted. Well, we'll wait, sighed the policeman. It's a montage, exclaimed John indignantly when he was presented with the tape recorder. Yes, she was hitting on me. And when I blew her off, she decided to get revenge. Well, the examination will show whether it's a montage or not, the investigator grinned. In the meantime, I have a question for Victoria. Did he do the black eye too? Yes, she nodded. Because she was hanging all over me, shouted John. So you don't deny it? She was hanging all over me. You're such a shit, Victoria said contemptuously, and you can't take responsibility for your actions. At that moment, Sarah suddenly felt sympathy for Victoria. What a human being, she thought of her colleague. But that was just the beginning. Sarah, I'm sorry, Victoria said as they stepped out into the hallway, stupid. I just... Anyway, I'm sorry if you can. Already forgiven, Sarah smiled. You're really good. Selene was of the same opinion. Come on, Victoria was a little embarrassed. What did I do? It would be awful if the guys were brought in for nothing. Yes, the principal shook her head and turned to Sarah. How are you? It's fine now, she replied. Are you sure? Selena, why don't I take Sarah's shift? Victoria suggested. What's her shift now? Well, I'm all for it. The principal nodded. Sarah, really go home. I'll call you a cab right now. Thank you very much. She thanked her colleagues. A couple minutes later, the police officers brought John out of the principal's office, handcuffed. John gave Victoria a hateful look, but she definitely turned away. I'm releasing the guys on their own recognizance, said the investigator, but your employee will have to come with us. The phone rang from the teacher's lounge. Sarah, the cab's pulling up, the principal shouted. Looking out the window, the girl did see a car with a lighted checker. Well, I'm off, she said to Victoria with a smile, happy detachment. Good night. As Sarah settled into the back seat of the car, she suddenly heard. Good evening, Sarah. Good evening, she replied confusedly, and recognizing Mickey, her student's father, as the driver, smiled warmly. Good evening, Mickey. Sarah fell silent, remembering the man's middle name. Mickey, he smiled correctly interpreting the girl's silence. I thought you had another job, Sarah said, remembering that Mickey's parents' information had listed him as a sysad man at a bank. Other, the man confirmed, I work part-time here. That's what a single parent does. It's what I do. You're a wonderful father, the teacher smiled. Cindy's been talking about you for years. You wouldn't believe it about you too, laughed Mickey. Oh, really? Seriously. And what did Cindy say about me? Unless, of course, it's a secret. No, he shrugged. Cindy said you were a good teacher and a good person. Well, that's good to hear. In truth, Cindy had said something else. But Mickey didn't want to say anything about that, so he moved on to another topic. When Mickey met Catherine, he felt like the happiest man in the world. Six months later, the young people decided to get married. A month later, Ekaterina proudly told Mickey that she was expecting a child. Catherine, I adore you, exclaimed the happy father-to-be. And I you, the young woman smiled gently at her husband. And then Cindy was born, and the young parents happily immersed themselves in caring for their baby girl. The daughter was two years old when Catherine became pregnant again. Mickey really wanted a son, and God heard him. The ultrasound showed that they were having a boy. It seemed that happiness would last forever. The pregnancy was difficult, and Ekaterina began to have serious health problems. Doctors unanimously insisted on terminating the pregnancy, but the future mother did not want to hear about it. After all, the child was already living, breathing, with a beating heart. The labor started early. Prepare for the worst, the doctor said, and still Mickey hoped for a miracle. 
but alas, newborn Robert's first cry coincided with his mother's last breath. Catherine was only 25. The baby was born weak and was placed in a cavette. Two days later, on the day of Catherine's funeral, his little heart stopped baking. He must have sensed that his mother was being escorted to her final journey, Catherine's inconsolable mother said bitterly. After losing his wife and son, Mickey became distraught with grief. When he learned that his son was gone, the young widower went to church and placed candles for the repose of Catherine and Robert. Then he approached the face of Jesus. Why? Mickey asked desperately. Why did you do this to me? Why did you take Catherine away from me so soon? Why did you take the baby away from me? God sends a man as many trials as he can bear, someone behind him said quietly. The man turned around and saw the priest. Yeah, but it's so cruel. Mickey shook his head. I'm a widower with a three-year-old daughter in my arms. My wife wanted to give me a son, and she bore him at great risk to her health. And today, Robert was gone, and the widower wept bitterly. You have someone to live for, my son, the priest said affectionately, and added, crossing Mickey. Go to your daughter. She's waiting for you. Cindy asked when Mommy and her little brother were coming. That same day, Mickey explained to the girl that they were in heaven. Will they come to visit? The little girl asked, her eyes wide open, and her father envied her hurtfully. After all, in the incomplete three years of age, a person is not able to realize and accept that the person is no longer there and will never be. Therefore, grief as such is not felt. No, they won't be able to come visit, sighed Mickey. Do we go to them? asked the daughter. Yes, Cindy, one day we will meet them and we'll be together. Hopefully that won't happen for a while yet, Mickey thought bitterly. Although, from now on, he had to learn to live without Catherine and the son he had been waiting for. It wasn't easy, but Mickey managed, because he had the powerful incentive of a young daughter, Cindy, his princess. Mickey worked as a system administrator in a bank and earned a good living. But he wanted his daughter to have the best of everything, so he went to work as a taxi driver. My daughter grew up to be a smart girl, and with every day by day, she became more and more like Catherine. She pleased her daddy as best she could. Cindy enjoyed participating in the kindergarten matinees, drawing them together and signing each family portrait, me and my favorite daddy. The girl learned to read at the age of five, and every night she read poems and fairy tales to Mickey. Cindy did her chores playfully, which delighted the adults. Catherine, too, learned early to do all the housework, Grandma Leslie said one day, and the eyes of the poor woman who had buried her daughter filled with tears. When Cindy went to school, she suddenly started asking her father if he wanted to get married. What stunned Mickey? Why the sudden question? It's just that one day Grandma Leslie said you're still young and you need a woman, the daughter explained. Ah, 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 he nodded. I see then. Maybe Cindy fears that I'll get married, have a baby, and I'll love her less. Suggested Mickey and hurried to reassure his daughter. I'm certainly not planning on it any time soon. I mean, we're good together, right? The daughter's answer struck a nerve. Okay, nodded Cindy, but I wish I had a mom. Our teacher, Sarah, is so nice and beautiful. I wish I had a mom like that. Mickey remembered a short young woman with long hair the color of ripe wheat and kind eyes, like Catherine's. She's really pretty, he thought suddenly. When Mickey arrived at the tea party, he realized he was missing. This was the kind of woman he wanted to live his life with. Sarah's soft voice was mesmerizing and enveloping, and as she poured tea from the large samovar, Mickey's breath caught. It looked so homely. Unexpectedly, the man imagined how he and this beauty were sitting on the terrace of his country house and drinking tea from the samovar. Well, aren't you an idiot? Mentally, he scolded himself. Sarah is my daughter's teacher. And besides, such an attractive woman must have someone else. 
No matter how hard Mickey tried not to think about her, the kind, smiling face with the radiant brown eyes kept popping up in front of his eyes. And when he saw Sarah when he took a cab to her daughter's school, his legs suddenly felt suspiciously woozy. A stray thought suddenly flashed through his mind. What if it's fate? As they drove and chatted about everything, Mickey felt as if he and the woman had known each other for years. They hadn't. It seemed to him that it wasn't the first time they'd been in his Renault, and Sarah wasn't in the car as a passenger. As a spouse, Mickey thought, and the thought gave him unparalleled pleasure. There's my house, Sarah pointed to a blocky nine-story snake building. Mickey hated to part with the charming passenger, but he couldn't help it. Being a man who could make the best out of any situation, he remembered that he had Sarah's cell phone number, and now he knew where she lived. Isn't that something to be happy about? In the morning, when Mickey went to the car wash, he found thin velvet gloves in the car. Friday night is a hot time, and a lot of women have traveled in the car, including women who have been drinking. They tend to forget their cell phones, bank cards, and everything else in the cab. But Mickey was somehow sure that the gloves belonged to Sarah. Anyway, it was easy to check. While the young washerwoman finished Mickey's iron horse to a mirror shine, he dialed the number of his daughter's teacher. Hello, he heard a soft, melodic, and so welcome voice. Good morning, Sarah, he mothered with a smile. Hello, she replied politely. Here's the thing. Anyway, I found these beige velvet gloves in the car. These wouldn't happen to be yours, would they? It's very possible. There are some. But I'll have a look. Mickey prayed to God that Sarah would turn out to be the owner of the gloves, and he heard him. You know, guess, said the girl. All right, Mickey didn't fudge a bit. So here's what we'll do. I'll come over in an hour, or a little later, and give you your stuff. All right, it's a deal. After waiting for the car to be washed, Mickey drove to the house where the lady of his heart lived. I'm dreaming, you idiot. He told himself. When Mickey pulled up, he dialed Sarah's number. I'm in position, he said. Well and fine, replied the girl cheerfully. Go up to the 45th apartment, we'll have tea. Is it comfortable? Hesitating slightly, Mickey asked. Well, if I'm offering it, it's convenient, laughed Sarah. I should thank you somehow. Looks like the lady is free, he thought gleefully. He should not, however, have jumped to conclusions. What could be the matter? What if Sarah wanted revenge on her lover, or even on her husband? Mickey got out of the car, but he didn't go to the driveway, but to a small store on the side of the house. He bought a small cake, a bunch of bananas, and a box of candy. As he left the store, Mickey saw a flower stand. Just what we need, he thought contentedly, and walked resolutely toward the kiosk. After buying a pretty bouquet of roses, complete with small white florets, Mickey strode into the driveway. Sarah was setting the table for tea, but for some reason everything was falling apart, and the guest had disappeared. The girl caught herself thinking that it would have been nice if he hadn't come at all, and to help with the gloves, not much value. But just as Sarah was finishing the thought, the doorbell rang, and she ran to open it. Mickey stood on the doorstep with a cake, a bouquet of roses, and a bag. This is for you, he said with a smile, holding out a bouquet of roses to Sarah. Thank you, the girl smiled back. It's a very beautiful bouquet. Come into the kitchen. Oh well, you shouldn't have spent so much, exclaimed Sarah as Mickey pulled candy and bananas out of the bag. Of course you should have. He objected. It is a crime to go to such a beautiful woman empty-handed. They sat down to tea, but the conversation was not going well. They were both too excited and didn't know what to say. Do you live alone? Mickey broke the silence. With her parents, she replied, though they were away at the moment. Did you go on vacation? No, a symposium. They are not ordinary doctors, but PhDs. Oh, how? He stretched out respectfully. Cool. I don't know, Sarah shrugged but I hadn't really thought about it. Maybe because I've been living with it since I was a kid. Who are your parents? 
My dad's a trolley driver. My mom works in a bakery. Sarah, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. I apologize wildly, but is it a fashion to put the dress, um, on the wrong side? Looking around herself, the girl saw that she had indeed worn her house dress inside out and blushed like a cancer. How good she is when she blushes, thought Mickey admiringly. I'll change now, she said, apologizing. For what? inquired the guest. Well, I don't know. Suddenly both of them laughed merrily. You know it looks good on you, Mickey said with a laugh. Really? smiled Sarah. I'll change anyway. I'll be right back. Don't, Mickey asked, and sitting down beside Sarah, pulled the girl to him and kissed her, shyly and hesitantly at first, like a seventh grader, and then bolder. Sarah snuggled up to him, as if this wasn't the first time she'd kissed him. She breathed in the scent of Mickey's perfume, and she felt better than she'd ever felt in her life. Isn't this the good fiancé grandma was talking about? It flashed through her mind, because it all fits. Sarah, whispered Mickey, you're my good, beautiful, desirable. It sounded so intimate that the girl was frightened. It doesn't add up. She besought herself. By the way, he is the father of a pupil, and I am behaving, not like a teacher, but like, like a straight girl. Sarah resolutely released herself from Mickey's embrace and nervously ogled herself. Sorry, those, he muttered. Yeah, I shouldn't have. It's okay, the girl muttered. I'll, I'll go change, the dress. Yeah, sure. Sarah walked out of the kitchen and went to change her dress. I seem to have lost my head, she mentally stated, for good. And Mickey suddenly pictured Sarah changing her dress. His throat went dry, and he realized that he could barely contain himself from following her. And if Mickey did, he'd be in trouble. He sipped his cool tea and was relieved when he heard Sarah's footsteps. More tea. She offered, trying to act as if nothing had happened. Ah, no thanks, I should probably go. They both remembered the purpose of their visit in the hallway when Sarah came out to see them off. Mickey reached into his pocket and pulled out his gloves. I almost forgot, he smiled. Then you'd have to go back, Sarah remarked. Yes, Mickey whispered, and without realizing what he was doing, he started kissing the girl. She didn't think to resist, but the ringing of the doorbell brought them both to their senses. Sarah opened the door and after saying goodbye to her guest, let Angelica in. However, commented her friend on what she had seen. Let's go to the kitchen, Sarah tossed. Noticing the signs of a feast, Angelica said, I see you're not wasting any time. Oh, it's nothing. Sarah waved her hand. It was just a cab driver. I'd left my gloves in the car and he brought them back. So I thought I'd thank him. Thank you, Angelica asked ironically. Thank you, she nodded, served him tea and gave me a passionate kiss. What makes you say that? Oh, Sarah, I've known you too long to be wrong about anything. Your freaky look alone is enough. And the disheveled hair, the puffy lips, she winked. Angelica, Angelica what? I've been Angelique for 23 years, but I'll shut up. And if you give me tea with raspberry sprigs according to your grandmother's recipe, I'll be as quiet as a fish. Don't be silent like a fish, Sarah smiled, but I'll give you tea. I'll even give you a piece of cake. That's what I mean. Angelica exclaimed approvingly and settled into the spot where Mickey had been sitting the other day until he started kissing her. So you have something with him? Angelica asked. Pardon my curiosity, of course, but I'm allowed to. I don't have anything with him, Sarah sighed. But you wouldn't mind. Oh, Angelica, I think I'm in love to the very, cannot, she admitted. But there are some not that the obstacle, but... Sarah, my head is spinning. I haven't seen you in a few days, and you're having the time of your life. It sure does. Sarah nodded and told her friend about what had happened at the four ball. That's news. Angelica marveled. The genie has been detained. Yes. Serves him right. He won't litter the wonderful atmosphere of the biker club with his rotten person. 
We say hello to you, by the way. Thank you them too. By the way, would you like to come over today? Why wouldn't it be? That's great. And bring your boyfriend with you. What kind of boyfriend is he to me? Well, not a boyfriend, it will be, Angelica said with a shrug, but something tells me it's only a matter of time. And as you know, I'm almost never wrong. And I've never been so passionate that you weren't wrong this time either, Sarah said quietly. It's gonna be fine. Well, the fact that he's your student's father is no big deal. But it's like, ah, uh, immoral, you mean. For the life of me, I don't say anything immoral about it. Where there's true love, there's nothing immoral. And I'm sure that's the case here. There's a reason you haven't needed anyone for so many years. The friends sat around for a couple more hours and then went to a biker club in the evening. Sarah felt like she belonged this time and it was a great feeling. She had been given the nickname B. You have honey colored hair, Chippy noted. So I think the nickname B is just right. Why, smiled Sarah, I like it a lot. You know, Sarah, I actually called you here for a reason. Angelica smiled slyly and turned to her lover. Chippy. What? Nothing, she pouted. Do I have to? Well, I'm sorry, said Chippy, who, as it turned out, was called Victor. Angelica's boyfriend's last name was Chipovsky, hence the pseudonym. All right, brothers and sisters, Chippy proclaimed, Cindy and I have decided to get married. Everyone is invited to the wedding. The club's regulars applauded wildly, and then the exclamations began. Well done. That's news. Cool. Love and advice. You guys are such a great couple. Bitter. When the excitement around the upcoming marriage had died down a little, Angelica remembered John, better known in the club as Jeannie. When they heard that John had been detained, the club members unanimously decided that he should go to jail. They didn't get home until morning. Sarah fell asleep with her head barely touching the pillow. On Monday, she learned that John was facing jail time in all seriousness. What can I say? Shrugged Sarah, wanting to show himself as a hero. He ended up showing his true colors. I couldn't have said it better. Victoria approved. God, I was such a fool. Clinging to an illusion. Come on, said Sarah. We all make mistakes and you are no exception. Sarah, why don't we go you? A co-worker suggested it. I'd love to, she replied sincerely. From that date on, the colleagues became good friends. Victoria was only two years older than Sarah, so it was not surprising that they had a lot in common. After work, they'd go to the same cafe, where John had tried to invite Sarah, and sometimes they'd go shopping. And when she finally moved into her grandparents' apartment, Victoria went shopping with her and helped her pick out dishes, linens, and decorative details that were pleasing to a woman's heart. Victoria, I have a favor to ask of you, she said on the eve of Angelica's wedding, and what's the request? My high school friend is getting married the day after tomorrow, and I haven't picked out an outfit. Why don't you help me? No problem, Victoria smiled, I'll freshen up my closet. In the end, with joint efforts, the girls chose an elegant shimmering wine-colored dress. It should be matched with matching shoes, a friend remarked. I think so too, Sarah said sadly, but there's no money, and it's still a week away from payday. I can borrow it, Victoria said. It's kind of embarrassing. Stop it. It's uncomfortable sleeping on the ceiling. The blanket falls down. You'll give it back when you can. I assure you, you won't embarrass me. I've got a darling who's given me some money. Sarah knew that her friend was dating a wealthy man twice her age. According to her friend, the man was divorced. Maybe I should borrow money from Victoria if she's offering. Thought Sarah. Then I'll be very grateful, she said. That's a good girl. You see, she's uncomfortable. The wedding of Angelica and Victor, Aka, Cindy and Chippy, was being celebrated in a rented mansion that had once been a merchant's estate. Wow, thought Sarah, when her friend told her where the wedding would be, that's a lot of money. But as it turned out, 
Chippy could afford more than that. He was a successful computer programmer. As Sarah and the rest of the guests left the registry office, she was called out. At first, Sarah thought she was hallucinating. The voice that called out to her sounded suspiciously like Mickey's. Sarah, a voice called out and she turned around. Hallucinations were out of the question. Osipov was very real. And there was a smiling and dressed up Cindy standing next to him. Sarah, do you know Uncle Victor too? The student asked. I know a little, she nodded with a smile, and I'm actually a friend of his fiancé. Are you a friend of Uncle Victor's fiancé? Cindy was pleased. Ah, uh, yeah. After that meeting, Sarah and Mickey had been strictly business. She thought it was for the best, but at night she wanted to howl. And now, Mickey stood in front of Sarah and looked at her fondly. This is really fate, she thought, not even realizing that her lover was thinking the same thing. The marriage party approached them. Is everything all right? Angelica asked. I see you've already met my brother. With a smile, the groom turned to Sarah and winked at her. By the way, he's free. He's your brother. The friends exclaimed in unison. Well, yes, shrugged the happy newlywed with a smile. Why? Come on, Angelica said, and the newlyweds went to the wedding limousine. Sarah Mickey, I'll see you at the mansion, Victor said. Do you remember her? Sarah asked. Honestly, no, shook his head Mickey, but should he? You bumped into her at the door that day. Mmm, okay. How are you guys doing? Okay, nodded the girl, having moved to a new apartment not too long ago. You bought an apartment. What's the money for? She asked with a chuckle. I don't know. I hear they give teachers some kind of preferential housing. Maybe. But I've only been working at the school for two months, so it's out of the question for now. Daddy, can I take a picture with the bride and groom? Asked Cindy. Go, replied the father with a laugh and when the girl had withdrawn to a respectful distance, confessed. I've often thought of you and remembered our kisses. Mickey, don't. You have to. During that time, I realized I didn't need anyone else. And maybe I'm being presumptuous, but I can't believe you haven't thought of me. But Cindy, Sarah, when I said that Cindy was bugging me about you, there was one thing I didn't mention. Mickey held a meaningful pause and Sarah, Realizing she was about to hear something important, didn't interrupt. Cindy said she wished she had a mom like you. She was so stunned she didn't even notice the bride, broom and Cindy beside her. And you're still on you. Exclaimed Angelica in amazement and laughed. We need to fix this right away. That's easy, smiled Mickey. Sarah, are you really going to be my mom? Cindy asked. Well, it's too early to talk about that, the teacher smiled. Well, I think it's just right, said the bride. The main thing is, try to catch the bouquet. Well, now let's mount up. I'm as hungry as a hundred wolves. Well, I don't know, Sarah, Victoria said. I don't think anyone would judge you. When two people love each other, it doesn't matter who is who or who is who. And Selena is a wise and understanding woman, and she'll be happy for you. Sarah had been dating Mickey for a month and was afraid that her co-workers would find out about their relationship. However, Victoria, like Angelique, assured her that there was nothing awful about it. You haven't been in the smoking room today, Sarah said. And I'm not allowed to now, my friend smiled. Victoria, is that what I think it is? Victoria nodded and her eyes brightened. And Harvey, as soon as he found out, proposed to me. That's great. I'm so happy for you. Sarah exclaimed and hugged her friend. When are you? No marriage proposal has been made yet, she said. I'm sure it will, Victoria assured him. It was a few days after the conversation between the friends. Mickey came to see Sarah and told her that he had been offered a good place in the capital. Career prospects with all that entails, the lover told her, and Sarah's heart snapped. What about me? Sarah, will you come to Washington with me? Mickey asked. And as what? What do you mean who? 
He snorted, as my wife, of course. Sarah, marry me. Saying these words, Mickey got down on one knee and pulled a cherished red velvet box out of his sweater pocket. Yes, replied the girl, and tears of happiness spurted from her eyes. It's been a year. Remembering how Catherine's second pregnancy had ended, Mickey was very worried. Since the day Sarah had informed him of her pregnancy, he had forbidden his wife to lift anything heavier than a kitten and had been blowing dust off her. Despite his mother-in-law's assurances that the pregnancy was progressing perfectly and that there were no unpleasant surprises, Mickey was afraid. I wouldn't survive if something happened to you and the baby, he said. But everything went perfectly, and on New Year's Eve, Mickey and Sarah became parents of an adorable sturdy baby boy, whom they named Sam. On January 6, Mickey picked up his wife and son from the maternity hospital. They celebrated their first Christmas in the capital, in a close family circle, Mickey, Sarah and Cindy, who was delighted with her little brother. The baby was sleeping serenely in his crib, and the ghoul did not leave his side. It was very touching. Cindy seems to enjoy being a big sister, the young mother remarked. And that's great, my husband whispered with a smile, because we're going to have more kids, right? What about it? Sarah smiled gently at him, and Cindy would be an example to them in all things. The couple laughed quietly and clinked glasses of baby champagne, which Mickey drank in solidarity with his wife. They both knew this year would be a happy one. A lot of people couldn't believe what she'd done, and after a while, the unbelievable happened. Irma squirmed in the leather chair. She had long been interested in the psychologist with his velvet voice and slight, unshaven features. He was not a cheap specialist. An hour of his work cost as much as a dinner for two in a decent restaurant. The girl was sure that for that money he should do more than just act as an appreciative listener. Maybe even a hugger or a kisser. No, listen to me, Irma said in a worried voice. He comes over. We're together for two or three days. Everything's fine. We make plans. We're inseparable. We spend time together. And then he's gone again. He doesn't care about me. He disappears. He doesn't answer his phone. He just writes briefly. In a meeting. I'll call you back. I'm tired. I'm tired. I can't go on like this. How long has this been going on? Sebastian asked. He kept a notebook in his hand and made notes. But Alma wouldn't have been surprised to find some of the pictures they usually drew out of boredom or a nude portrait of her. At least, she would have liked him to draw her naked and with big breasts. Two years, the girl replied. No, well, let's reason. He probably doesn't like my shape. Oh, really? The girl stood up and slowly spun around her axis. Even a layman would have said the figure was stunning. Sebastian exhaled, definitely low self-esteem, because her hips were adorable, as were her hair, face, and other body parts. But he couldn't give her a good old-fashioned self-esteem boost. The doctor's ethics didn't allow it. Your thighs, Irma, are delightful, the psychologist replied with a casual smack. But let's get back to... No, wait, the girl waved her finger and turned her back again, showing off her firm ass. Delicious and you haven't even touched them once. You haven't checked them out, so to speak. Come on, don't be shy. She was literally demanding the most drastic therapy from him. Sebastian decided to turn the whole thing into a joke. He was just over 40, and a relationship with a 25-year-old patient was not part of his plans. After all, he was charging her half the usual fee, and he did it not so much to make money, but purely for support. Oh, Irma, said Sebastian, sit down, sit down, please. If it weren't for medical ethics, I'd... Come on, then, repeated the girl, without changing her posture. Come on, come on, let's get started. You said we should have a relationship of trust. It's okay, touch it. She didn't get the jokes. The psychologist noticed this peculiarity of her psyche during the first session. At that time, Sebastian wrote it off as stress. The girl was really in a deep depression. 
But now that she was obviously better, her sense of humor had not returned. It means that she will have to be serious all the time, and this is not conducive to a speedy treatment. Irma, you need to understand, said the psychologist. This is my job. If I have sex with every patient, I don't have the physical or mental strength to do therapy. I have a wife. Turn your face to me. Stop tempting me. He showed her the ring on his ring finger. Irma had noticed it during the first session, but at the time she had thought it was just a tribute to the image of a flawless psychologist, a man who had solved all his personal problems and now sought to help others. The girl thought that all men are the same, and if something happens they will not miss an opportunity to diversify their sexual experience, even if it's a patient, especially if it's about her. Many of my colleagues, pardon my frankness, have slept with their clients, Sebastian continued, and none of them could resist such a beautiful and young girl. I wish I had gotten one, Irma replied with a playful smile. With your permission, we'll wrap up this topic and won't return to it again, the psychologist asked, but he said it in a tone that doesn't tolerate objections. So, let's go back to your situation. What do you expect from Paul? Oh, Paul Holmes, a successful, incredibly gifted lawyer. Irma met him on the legal battlefield and immediately surrendered. Paul was a good-looking man, tall, slender, with a beautiful body, which he trained tirelessly every day, just like Grey in Fifty Shades of Grey. Paul is also the heir to a large fortune. The Holmes family has split into two branches. One, the dead end, is about to end with the old man's death. The other would continue to blossom, and she, Irma, could give Paul an hair, if not several. He struck her right away, the first time he met her. He was stingy with compliments, but expressed his sympathy otherwise by stroking and kissing her. He showed her his luxurious apartment with a swimming pool and an expensive car. Paul was perfect not only in material terms. As it seemed to her, he had a character that made him an ideal husband. He didn't like people, didn't socialize much. It was she herself who was drilling her way to his heart, though it didn't take much drilling, to be frank. What do I want? Irma repeated the question. I don't know. Marriage. A psychologist helped her. Children. Well, we're not in that kind of relationship to ask such questions. The girl pouted. You can be frank with me, Sebastian said. I'm your psychologist. Irma knew exactly what she wanted from Paul. First of all, she wanted him all to herself. Always on the radar, never hanging out with other girls. Secondly, to give her his proud name of Holmes, and with it the right to half of his property. Not to enrich himself, but to tie him down. And finally, what's a family without children? She could carry two or three boys or girls. Her personal physician told her she was in excellent health and had wide hips. I don't know, Irma replied. I don't know what I want from Paul Holmes. She looked at Sebastian again. Handsome, of course, and well-groomed. Probably goes to the gym, sticks to a diet, and gets a rejuvenating massage once a month. But not Paul, no. And besides, the pompous psychologist didn't even want to check the firmness of her thighs or abs that she had worked so hard on over the past few years. What does he know about female beauty? While at one end of the universe a beautiful girl at an appointment with an expensive psychologist was digging into the depths of her own soul, at the other end of the pole a tortured tramp was rummaging through trash bins. He rejoiced when these well-to-do people who had their own apartments and bathrooms, threw away something useful. Like a lighter, you can refill it and use it again. Or an electric kettle, even if it's not quite working. But you can take it to Roger, the electrician, and he'll give you a couple of dollars. He'll fix the kettle and sell it for a tenner. Everybody wins, everybody wins. Sometimes people threw food into the garbage cans that had just expired. In principle, it is possible to eat if you are not too much afraid of poisoning. 
but other homeless people have long ago taught our vagrant that food is not to be feared in principle, just like drinking. Then there's a chance you won't get poisoned, or at least not too badly. It's the body, pampered by a soft bed, that reacts so violently to infection and bacteria. Those who live on the street can get pneumonia on their feet, and often do. In general, the basis of a beggar's well-being is secondary resources. How good it is that all big stores have installed machines for accepting bottles and cans. It is bad enough that security guards may not let you into such supermarkets, or even worse, to take away the receipt for purchases, which was issued by the machine. The beggar collected anything that could bring him at least 10 or 20 cents. Paper, aluminum, glass. It is essential for a hobo to have a good cart with reliable wheels and a place to stash his belongings and wait out the bad weather. In summer, nature itself is on the side of the destitute. You can sleep anywhere, on a bench in the park, on the grass, under a bridge. In summer, people are careless. They leave their valuables as if they want to get rid of them. Hey, you! yelled the owner of a strong male voice from the window. Me? the beggar asked timidly. Get away from my crates, the voice demanded. Or I'll come out now and you know where I'll shove these boxes. The beggar knew. The crates did indeed look derelict. Someone had placed them near the bench. Inside were apples, pears, and something else. But apparently the owner had not found the strength to take them inside, yet. So all the vagrant could do was sigh and leave, and by all means. Sir, excuse me, he shouted. I really didn't know they were yours. Get out. A beggar should know how to apologize. For a bad look, for crossing the road, for a bad odor. For the very fact of his existence, if you ask me. If you can't apologize, you'll either get beaten up or call the police. Neither of which he wanted. After the sessions with the psychologist, Irma did a lot of thinking. She tried to understand herself, Paul, and others. On the one hand, she had everything. Her father had only two children, her and her older brother Gregor, but he'd made it on his own. He went into technology, into the information sector, and by the time he was 30 he was a millionaire. Gregor is the creator of the very system for finding tours for travel, which has won 5% of the world market, so she got all of her father's financial love. He gave her a nice and neat apartment in a new clubhouse. He bought her a car. Even if it was not the most expensive one, it couldn't be better. Finally, her father helped her find a good and dust-free position in the legal department of a large company. She coped well with the work, but to be fair, there were few tasks. She didn't depend on anyone financially at all, and her salary was enough to live comfortably. The only thing missing was true love. Hardly anyone would believe that this spectacular blonde had only had two men by the time she was 25. And even then the first one, if not accidental, then unwanted. So, a good acquaintance with whom she just spent time. But it was fine without him too. Paul was another matter. It was for him that she took care of herself. For him, she had her apartment renovated in style, and for a few months, he didn't offend her with his presence and was there most of the time. And then it started. First he started coming over less often. Then he stopped sharing her double bed with the most expensive orthopedic mattress. It was a pleasure to sleep on it, and even more so to love each other. Paul, what's wrong? She asked. Are you sick? No, he answered getting ready to leave. I'm not in the mood. I'll call you. And maybe if he'd left her altogether, said some hurtful words, the wound would have healed over time. But no. The man she loved acted like a subtle tormentor. He could schedule a meeting at the hotel, come to it, get her drunk on champagne, give her maximum passion and pleasure, and then disappear. Literally the same night or morning, it didn't matter. That's the thing, Paul said. It's a very interesting process right now. Here, listen to this. And talked about the cases he had won or would win. Despite the impressive wealth of the Holmes family, 
the lawyer never sat idle, and the way he won was the most exciting part. Like a chess player, he calculated his opponent's moves many moves ahead. Pa, you're so smart, she said, putting as much tenderness and love into her words as she could. You're a genius. Of course, replied Paul habitually. Genius is the training of the mind. Alas, she could boast neither the same flight of thought nor spectacular moves. She was given more of a technical job, which she handled perfectly. Not a fly would fly, not a mouse would pass without her prompting. It was this ability to control, bordering on insanity, that her supervisor valued in her. I hate fools, Paul said, and fools, they're boring. Am I clever? Irma asked coquettishly, but her lover was silent. Gradually their meetings became shorter and shorter, and Paul's movements more and more tense. And now he was only enough for a cup of coffee, a short walk in the park, or a couple of minutes of conversation. And then he would disappear, leaving her in great pain. Once or twice a month, as if taking pity, a man could give her love, but not even a night, but at most an hour or two. And half of that time he would talk on the phone, solving important issues. The trouble is that she has no one to share her worries with. The only things she could discuss with her girlfriends were making salads for New Year's Eve and traveling after the pandemic was over. With her mom, she was extremely cold, jealous of her dad. And with her father, she would never talk about such topics. She was just ashamed. That left the psychologist. He was old for her, of course, but she would not refuse close support and care. Invited him to a restaurant, offered to hold another session at a retreat at her home. But Sebastian, tactful and imposing, never said no. He just smiled and explained why a self-respecting doctor shouldn't get too close to his patients. But he didn't say no, just like Paul. She couldn't understand why she was attracted to men like that. During the next session, she looked at the psychologist again with interest. He was the kind of horse that wouldn't spoil the furrow and she had no doubt that Sebastian knew how to plow. But once again, the psychologist remained unapproachable, and all she could do was discuss her worries. I don't think Paul is capable of cheating on me, she said during another session. What makes you think that? asked Sebastian. You know, he's in the public eye all the time. I call him a lot. Would you answer a girl if you didn't want to be with her? I have already asked you many times to call me you, the psychologist replied. There's a nuance here. We don't even know what you want him to do. And reading his mind is a real art. Is it possible? The girl asked, hopefully, to read his thoughts. Yes, Sebastian said. I made a psychological profile of him in my head a long time ago. And read his mind, if that's easier for you. But you won't like the first or the second. No, tell me, Irma demanded. After all, she wasn't paying him that kind of money to keep secrets around here. All right, agreed the psychologist. Obviously, he has another woman. She came into his life before you. And at that point in your honeymoon relationship, she became distant. And then, for reasons unknown, their connection resumed. At first, she was in the background, but gradually she came to the forefront. And now this same Paul, indecisive and weak, can't tell you the truth. That's why he throws in the occasional handout in the form of sex. But all this, of course, cannot replace the emotional component of the relationship. He suffers as much as you do, but he hardly goes to a psychologist. Oh, don't say that, shrieked Irma and sobbed. He told me he was done with her, that they were no longer seeing each other. But, but how did you know? Sebastian knew all his dark sides. After all, he was an honored specialist, one of the best in this city. There's a reason his fees are so high. He saw the dark side in his patients and in other people. That's because he was one himself. And now, watching Irma sobbing, unable to accept the bitter truth, he felt pleasure. Yes, he liked that she was suffering and the way she did it. But in the end, it is also a method of therapy. It will now reach the stage of acceptance. 
It's been a long process already, and then it would be possible to dismantle and relive the negative emotions. Sebastian preferred to do without the cocktail of antipressants and tranquilizers. After all, he hardly ever took pills himself. Why were his patients any worse? It's not enough to accept it, the psychologist said. You have to accept it. There is, of course, a method of substitution. This is when the mental emptiness is filled by other relationships, usually carnal, but I don't recommend it. Why? Irma asked. It can be compared to anesthesia. To anesthesia, Sebastian explained. The fundamental cause of psychological distress doesn't go away. It stays. And then the pain can reappear with renewed vigor. Good, replied the girl. Thank you. I really feel better today. As she walked down the street, she could not accept that the doctor was so shrewd. If he could so easily calculate Paul, whom he had never seen before in his life, what could be said of her? Irma had been deceiving Sebastian and was always telling him things that were not true. And it was all the more unpleasant that he knew of these lies, but preferred not to notice them or pretended to. But a psychologist can be patient. More important for her is what to do right now, how to get through this pain. Irma decided to use substitution. In principle, she'd been thinking about it for a long time. You don't need to be a psychologist to understand such things. It was just indecision, some faint hopes that stopped her. But apparently Paul was finished. She couldn't admit her defeat publicly. So she needs a one-night stand, two at the most. A man who would discuss Paul when he found out about the affair. None of her acquaintances were suitable for this purpose. First of all, she had a reputation as an inaccessible and extremely unattainable girl. In the second place, all her friends and co-workers are handsome, status-conscious, wealthy men. She needs someone else. She didn't have time to look for a student or a cab driver. Besides, they might not be decisive enough. No, she'd need someone who had no one to go to. Someone who would pounce on her like a dog on a bone. And there was such a man. Outside the fence of their clubhouse, there was a separate garbage collection area. People with high environmental responsibility live in such status places, at least in words. So everyone, from small to large, threw paper, plastic and glass into different bins. And every morning when she was going for a run, a nameless man of indeterminate age shoveled out some of the resources. You can tell by the way he looks that he's gone downhill. Maybe he'd always been like this. Maybe he'd lost his place and his job. He always looked away from Irma, as if apologizing for his own presence. But the couple times she'd seen his face once so scary, just unshaven. The thought of spending the night with him seemed disgusting, though. Giving myself to some bum. What could be more disgusting? But at the same time, the idea was appealing. It gave her a strange sensation in her lower abdomen, like she was touching something forbidden. And now the idea of inviting this nameless garbage collector to my house didn't seem so strange. After all, people drag dogs and kittens off the street to warm them up and feed them. How could she be any worse? And then she'd see if he was too ugly or old, she could just kick him out or call the police. Yeah, she can handle the case. Luxury apartment daddy's gift. New neighborhood, low-rise development, underground parking. He bought her an experimental version, with her own lawn. This area, closed off from the street, was called a terrace. There were two entrances to the apartment. One from the beautiful entryway, with its own lobby, and a place where residents could wash their dog's paws, and a separate door from the terrace. There are no cameras. There's a way to lure this homeless man to your place, wash him, necessarily, warm him up, and give himself to him. Irma smiled. For the first time in a long time her mood improved, and be sure to take a picture. When Paul will see, when he knows what she went for him, he will kill himself for sure. With this thought the girl began to prepare for the operation, to sleep with a bum. She was accustomed to take any case as seriously as possible, even such a strange one. 
It was not yet seven o'clock in the morning when the beggar once again approached his permanent meeting point. At this time, a rare tenant would disturb his tranquility, and he could quietly collect waste paper, look for cans, and some other things that these rich people throw into containers. The cart quickly filled up with recyclables. He was so engrossed in the process that he didn't even notice the girl approaching him. I have more at home, she said to the homeless man. He pretended not to hear. Man, I have more waste paper at home. Would you like to take it? The garbage collector jingly turned his head in her direction. He seemed endlessly ashamed of his social status and appearance. Nearby, literally two meters away, stood the very fairy who took off for a run every morning, in tight pants and top, expensive sneakers. He tried to look at the face a little higher. Not her breasts, not her thighs, not her legs. Did you say that to me? He asked, apologizing in a voice that only beggars with his seniority know how to do. Yes, and who should? Irma replied with a smile. She was glad that at least the bum didn't smell. I see that you pick up the garbage in the morning, but I'm not bothering anyone. The man excused himself. Yes, it's a useful thing to do. The girl nodded and looked around. There was no one on the street at this early hour and the grounds were hidden by the trees. She didn't want anyone to see her chatting with a beggar and then dragging him back to her house. If you can't, I'll leave, the bum continued. Stop it, the girl waved her hand. I'm telling you, I have two boxes of waste paper at home. I can give them to you, but I can't carry them myself. You can come to my place and get them. He looked at her in disbelief. Usually such beautiful girls, like the resident of an elite house, don't talk to him. They don't notice him. Pretend he didn't exist. And he encouraged them in every possible way. You have to be realistic. Fairies like that exist for wizards. He was in the lowest place possible in that hierarchy, so he had no claim to anything. Well, he replied, I'm not going. Why? She asked. I'll get beaten up there, the homeless man explained. Like I've been beaten, or bullied, or some kind of video will be recorded. One of my comrades was set on fire. Oh, come on, said Irma. I do charity work, by the way. I can help with more than just waste paper. Come on, they won't beat me. The tramp asked incredulously. If anything happens, tell me at once. No, silly. The girl gave the prettiest smile she could muster at the bum. She didn't like the idea of sleeping with him anymore, but she wasn't the type to give up halfway through. Irma would go all the way. The homeless man looked at her hesitantly. He sensed a catch. On the other hand, he hadn't talked to a girl like this in years, especially not one so beautiful. Today, he wore relatively clean clothes and hardly stank at all. He wanted so badly to go into one of those luxurious apartments, maybe even sit on the floor. Maybe she had a coffee machine at home and would make him a cup of coffee. I'll be quick, he said. I won't disturb anything, I swear. Don't make excuses. Irma tried to joke. She hadn't been very good at it since she was a child. Just leave it all here, the cart and the loot, and follow me as if at a distance. All right, there's a gate over there, a private entrance to my terrace. Life has its surprises. One day, he was rummaging through the trash and found a wallet with $200 in it. Problem is, he couldn't use the money properly. He got drunk, fell asleep, and when he woke up, the dollars were gone. So now, you have to be very careful not to spoop your luck. He liked following the fairy from a distance. Her tights were tight around her fur mass, and she swayed her hips as she walked. It was a sight to behold. Besides, he didn't have to worry about anyone catching him doing it. The girl seemed to be in the mood for maximum charity and gave him not only a kind word, but also the sight of her beautiful figure. They entered the expensive apartment from a separate entrance. The drifter realized it was a special kind of chick, almost like a private house in a big city. He immediately wanted to take off, not just his shoes, but his own skin, so as not to defile the place. 
It was obvious that this place was designed by a designer who was not restricted in anything. The beggar searched with his eyes, trying to find something that looked like recyclables. Where's the waste paper? He asked, looking around the luxurious apartment. I'll look for him. The girl answered and locked the door. Then she meticulously examined his clothes. You know what? I think you should wash these clothes. But, said the bum, don't worry, I have a washer and dryer, Omer said. Here, go into the bathroom. Throw everything in there, and I'll come back later and turn it on. Can I? The homeless man began in an ingratiating tone. Can I? Shall I wash up? The girl asked innocently. Yes, there's a bathtub full. I wanted to take it myself after my run, but by all means, have a bath. Even if he was going to be the victim of a humiliating prank, he didn't care anymore. Stephen walked into the bathroom, which was the size of a downtown one-bedroom. He quickly threw off his pants, sweater, t-shirt, socks, and put it all in the washing machine. I thought about it and put my underwear in the same place. I walked over to the round bathtub that the designer had placed in the center of the room. Carefully, as if afraid of waking up, I climbed into it. The warm water felt blissful. It was good that there was foam on the surface. The water must have darkened by now. He found a sponge and began to rub his body, scraping away the dirt. At this time, Irma stood in the living room and hesitated. She had wanted to bring a bum into the apartment and use him, and here he was, sitting in her expensive bathtub. Everything had gone exactly as she had planned, which made her proud. But the fact that she was supposed to sleep with the homeless man made her a little uncomfortable. The thought seemed disgusting, like picking up a chocolate bar dropped by someone on the sidewalk and eating it. But then she imagined Paul's face when he found out, the anger in him, the way he gasped in disgust. She immediately felt light and cheerful. Yes, we must teach that scoundrel a lesson and at the same time to give this poor tramp a surprise he had never dreamed of. Perhaps it would be the brightest event in his aimless life. Stephen lounged in the bathtub and moaned with delight. He dived in, so he could wash his hair too. He had been in a good bathhouse long ago, when he had not yet fallen to his lowest ebb. There was a bathtub like this, but deeper. Just like that time, he rubbed himself with a loofah with pleasure. This is just a holiday, thought Stephen. I wish I had more now. And before he could even finish the thought, there was a quiet knock at the door, but only out of politeness, as if his permission or invitation meant nothing. It was the same pretty girl he saw every morning on his jog. She wore only a silk robe, a semi-transparent robe that fit her hips nicely and did not hide her magnificent breasts at all. Mind if I join you? The girl asked. His throat was dry with excitement. The very part of his manhood that he had long ago used only for its intended purpose came alive. He didn't even have time to say anything before the girl threw off her robe and sat down in the bathroom, completely naked, and he didn't even know her name. With her right hand she started stroking his leg and more. Stephen started moaning harder. Kicking a homeless man out turned out to be more difficult than bringing him into the house. After sex in the bathtub, she carelessly bent over to turn on the machine, and so the sex continued. Then she thought three times was better than two and gave herself to him on the leather couch. There she took a picture on her phone, but a glimpse, furtively, so he wouldn't notice anything. Then, when they were dressed, the vagrant lover asked for coffee. Isn't that enough for you? She asked. I don't want any more. No, regular coffee. He pleaded, and Alma relented. Especially since the living room had the most modern coffee machine you could buy. It made several kinds of drinks, including lats and cappuccinos. Tramp asked for a large mug of regular coffee, no sugar. At first, she wanted to pour the drink into a plastic cup. But then she thought, since she was letting him use her own body, why not provide the utensils as well? I understand there will be no waste paper, he said. Then an interesting truth was revealed to her. 
As long as the bum was silent or coy, she liked him. It's like bringing home a kitten, warming it, giving it milk. But as soon as the animal lets out its claws, tears up the furniture or peas in her slippers, she immediately begins to regret her own kindness. I can give you a couple of dollars, Irma replied. Not even. Let's put it this way. I give you a hundred, and you forget me and this spontaneous morning. I don't need dollars, the homeless man replied proudly. I won't be able to forget such a thing anyway. He made an attempt to come closer and kiss her, but the girl had already sobered up from the intoxicating potion of jealousy and revenge. She slapped the homeless man on the cheek, but not hard, so that he realized the show was over. It was time to lower the curtain and start cleaning the hall, especially since it was really necessary. I'm sorry, he said. Thank you very much for everything. What for? Irma asked. She was beginning to enjoy bullying this tramp. Well, I am. For giving herself to you, such a dirty tramp. The girl continued with a sneer. For washing me. Ah, uh, no, Stephen replied. No, not for that. Then why? Irma persisted. The man was beginning to annoy her. For kindness, he said. The girl was somehow disarmed by such words, and she felt a kind of sympathy for the beggar again. Maybe if they had met in a different environment, and he wasn't such a degraded man. No, such thoughts should be banished from her mind. She used it to relieve stress, and that was it. You should go now, the girl said. Can I have more coffee? The homeless man begged again. And spend the night? I don't want to leave so badly. No. Irma cut him off. Go away and forget the path to this house. Please. I'll call the police, the girl replied. She was suddenly a little scared. This man has nothing to lose, and she let him right into her house. What if he wants to steal something and kill her? Rape is unlikely, but it's rare for a man to do it more than three times. Her legs were shaking from the exertion of a long jog. No cops, he said suddenly looking around. I'm out of here. I'm leaving. The door slammed. She really felt better, and the plan to sleep with a homeless man went off like clockwork. Irma was convinced that a homeless vagrant who collected waste paper in the mornings could be a good lover. The way he pounced on her, all she had to do was close her eyes to avoid seeing his haggard face. Everything else was fine. There was only one thing the girl thought of at the last moment. Contraception. She had only had two partners in her sex life, and she had not used condoms with them. From Paul, she wanted to get pregnant, but this lawyer could control himself 100%. She reassured herself that the risk of contracting anything in the water was minimal. And then she took an antibiotic. But just in case, she decided to check in with the doctor in another month. It was Saturday, for which she had lots of plans. But Irma decided not to go out. She would write to her friend Betty about this little adventure. Irma knew that she corresponded with Paul, which meant that he would get it too. The thought made her feel so blissful that she was ready to open a bottle of champagne. Betty, you'll never guess what happened. Remember that time at your bachelorette party we talked about sleeping with a tramp? Sebastian realized that the therapy had been a success. He ran some quick tests and was amazed at the results. Her anxiety level had decreased and her self-esteem had risen to adequate levels. There's a reason he's called one of the best psychologists in the country. And not only in the materials he ordered from journalists himself. I see you're feeling better, Sebastian asked. Oh yes, replied Irma. Doctor. It's like a liberation. It's like I've been in prison, and now I'm out. Good for you, smiled the psychologist. This stage is called euphoria. You know, like wearing tight shoes for a long time and then taking them off. You have to be careful with this stage, too. What do you mean? The girl asked. Don't be alarmed, my dear. The doctor hastened to reassure her. I am not saying that the ailment will return, no. It's just that in a state of euphoria, one is prone to rash actions. During this period, 
please avoid important decisions. Like what? One of my patients got married in a state of euphoria, the psychologist explained, to a man she had known for one month. So, what? And the fact that their union had broken up very quickly, Sebastian explained, and she was left alone with a child. But it was a very desirable child on her part. He's in therapy with me now. We are trying to correct his narcissism and behavioral disorders. Irma wondered, was she really euphoric? No, she'd just gotten her revenge on Paul, so hard that when he found out, wait, had he already found out? Would he write to her, call her, beg her to see a doctor and sell the apartment? Paul's so squeamish. It's a good thing Betty told him the story. That she slept with a bum and it was good for her. Doctor, I think we should take a break from our sessions, the girl said. I hope this doesn't offend you. Don't be, smiled Sebastian. I have a lot of work to do. It was a pleasure to study with you. The psychologist knew how to speak sincerely. In fact, he took the news that their sessions would be interrupted for a while with ill-concealed delight. Irma had become annoying, annoying, and that was the worst part of his job. And her thoughts about him treating not only her soul, but her body as well. No, but somehow I can't just walk away, the girl said. It's like the gestalt was unclosed. I see what you're implying, Sebastian replied. But you and I have had this conversation many times before. Too bad you're so principled, doctor. Irma pouted. Can I at least give you a peck on the cheek? It can be done, the psychologist smiled. She walked over to him, moved closer to his cheek, and then abruptly dug her lips in, literally sucked on it. Thank you now, doctor, said a satisfied Irma. It would be good if Paul knew about the kiss with the mature psychologist, too. She walked away to the door, swaying her magnificent hips. Now she knew for sure that they were incomparable. Stephen felt disgusted for the second week in a row. The whole thing with the pretty girl who had given herself to him seemed like a dream. After a few hours spent in the warm and cozy apartment, he was so sick of going back to the street. He still came to that rich man's house every morning and saw that fairy again. But she passed by, pretending that he did not exist. Go away. I'll call the police, she said when he tried to move closer. Or the husband. No, no. Stephen waved his hands. I need waste paper. That's all I need. Go on your way, the fairy demanded, pulling pepper spray from her pocket. Or security will be here in a minute, along with her husband. But after what happened, there was nothing. The girl replied sharply. Once again, your husband will come and you will look pale. Of course, of course, she has a husband. These rich people can afford all kinds of liberties, all kinds of experiments. Figuratively speaking, she wanted something spicy, something forbidden, and she got it. And the fact that he, Stephen, has a name and a soul is of no interest to anyone. Forgive me, he said, stepping away. I'm sorry, I won't bother you again. He ran away. He had few women. He had little time to get to know them. Stephen was born in one of those neighborhoods you don't want to miss. He never knew his father, and his mother spent all her time looking for work, trying to get by. From childhood, Stephen was left to himself. He did not like school. That he was constantly teased for the ridiculous clothes bought by his mother. Don't let me down, was all she said. You're the only thing I have, the only thing I have left. As a child, he could disappear to the library, which he loved not only for the books, but also for the free tea. But that didn't stop him from getting into bad company, drinking and smoking. He was a disappointment to his mother, time and again ending up in the police or stealing from her for small things. Because you can't steal big from your mom. She herself is as poor as a church mouse. And at the age of 19, after many priors and symbolic punishments, he foolishly ended up in a penal colony. His story was as banal as that of dozens of other unfortunate comrades. In pursuit of easy money, Stephen began to drive the cargo of Big Stan, a notorious kingpin in their neighborhood. 
and once he got caught by the cops, they were very happy to intercept a drug shipment, even if it wasn't the biggest. Juice him up, the cops said. You'll get another year. And if you don't talk, I'll give you a king's sentence. Stephen didn't turn anyone in at the time. Therefore, only seven years later, at the cost of incredible effort and suffering, he found himself on the outside. Big Stan did not appreciate his deed, and there was nowhere to go. His mother didn't wait for him. A couple months before his release, his heart stopped. His room was repossessed, and he had nowhere else to go. For three years, Stephen hung around the neighborhood, collecting bottles, cardboard, and doing odd jobs. But he didn't go down. He couldn't go on living like this, but he didn't want to go back to prison either. Of course he did. Seven years in four walls. Immediately after his release, he got in touch with a kind woman who seemed at first to be ten years older than he was. But her kindness quickly faded, and Stephen found himself in the position of a whipping boy. After six months of humiliation and constant shame, the man thought that it was better to live on the street than with such a megalomaniac. He'd been alone ever since. He carefully avoided those tramps who could give him something resembling love. And he couldn't afford professional mistresses of passion. But for a man on the street, the planning horizon shrank to a single day, so Stephen did not suffer much from loneliness. See you later with the beautiful fairy. He wanted to ask her name, but she only covered his mouth. And now this rambling invitation for waste paper, which in the end didn't turn out to be any, had completely changed his life. Now he too wanted to live in his own apartment, get coffee at the push of a button, and take a bath. Stephen, hi. I could hardly find you. You need to hide, Stan said. The police are looking for you. Not that they were friends. More like companions in misfortune. Stan had helped him more than once. He gave him expired sandwiches that the supermarket threw away every day, gave him vouchers for the night shelter. Stephen tried to be a grateful companion. He gave him cigarettes if he could get a few. He could spare an extra dollar. Why? I don't know, but they were on the prowl, Stan said. There's a place where you can lay low. I'll make inquiries and find out what's going on. Oh, really? It's not that the homeless never help each other, but constant hunger, cold and drinking kill a person's personality. That's why a vagrant is always selfish. He thinks only of himself, but this is purely to do with survival. If you waste all your energy on others, you'll die on your own feet. That's why Stan's offer was so strange. It wasn't customary for homeless people to help each other. But this was exactly the kind of situation in which he knew why they were interested in him. The fairy's husband must have started asking questions, and she told him she'd brought him to her place and that they slept together. Made up a rape story, and now they were looking for him to throw him in jail once again. Maybe not seven years, maybe ten. So, hesitant though he was, he accepted Stan's offer. Together, they walked to the abandoned building. It did look like a good place to hide. Come on in, Stan offered and smiled. Come on in, get settled in. Stephen opened the door, stepped inside, and stunned. Two weeks after the spontaneous sex with the homeless man, Irma began to notice changes in herself. She had a beastly appetite. Her usual portion had almost tripled. Her breasts were constantly aching. And once her stomach was aching, it ached like it had never ached before, and it was still a woman's day. Paul had really written to her. A delicate calculation that the story would reach him through Betty had paid off. Is it true? He asked. What really? Irma was surprised and added surprised emoticons to the message. That you slept with some lowlife. No, Irma replied. Thank God, Paul wrote. I knew you weren't like that. Irma said nothing. She just threw him a picture of a homeless man standing over her blooming body. Paul would have no problem recognizing her, because her navel was in the picture. And there's a piercing, the same earring he gave her. Then she blocked the contact, blocked it for good. She had to move on, like dealing with her body. It's possible that she's not feeling well. 
some hormones or something. She just got an invitation yesterday for a full medical exam at the clinic her father's insurance bought her. It was worth taking advantage of. Irma wasn't afraid of doctors, and if she felt sick, she'd choose a specialist. Everything in the private medical center was beautiful. Everything was smart. The girl felt like a welcome guest here, not a patient. She took tests, went through seven doctors, and even had a nice conversation with the local psychologist. He, like Sebastian, turned out to be an aging man with a velvet voice. No abnormalities, he said, smiling, and looked at the monitor. But I would recommend a little workup before such an important event. What event? The girl was surprised. The doctor only smiled. Then she sat in the lobby and drank coffee. It wasn't some machine that poured a drink for a couple of coins, but a real waiter. He came up to her with a menu and asked her what she wanted to drink and eat. She didn't feel like eating, but she didn't refuse the coffee. After ten minutes of waiting, the receptionist sat down on her couch and unfolded a bulky folder with printouts of her tests and examinations. Early pregnancies go without abnormalities, she said. Of course, you can't detect the fetal egg at this stage, but you will have your first ultrasound at six to eight weeks. I beg your pardon, Irma said and immediately choked on her coffee. Pregnancy. The receptionist covered her mouth with her hand. She must have thought that the client had chosen this particular course of examination for a reason. I'm sorry for my tactlessness, the girl smiled. I assumed that since you had chosen the early Head Start program. Yes, that's the program, said the girl. I thought it was about taking care of your body and health at an early age. I thought it was about keeping your body and health young. No, said the receptionist. This course is usually chosen by expectant mothers who want to make sure that their baby is well from the first day. Silence. Irma was digesting the information she had received and still couldn't believe it. When was the last time she was with Paul? Two months ago. So the supposed child could have only one father. She didn't even know his name. I have a question, Irma said. At what term is it acceptable to terminate a pregnancy? Without harming your health. There was a fat policeman sitting in an abandoned building, and next to him must have been an investigator. A tall man in a long coat. Their bench was to the side. You wouldn't see it until you walked in. While the cop was smiling, the other was looking at Stephen intently, literally drilling him with his gaze. When the beggar wanted to rush back, the traitor grabbed him by the shoulders. Stan laughed too, turning to his patrons. You see how I am, he used to say. Like prey, you might say. All right, here's the fee. Would you like a kick in the ass? The cop was indignant and raised his hand as if to strike. Get out of here while I'm being nice. But the man in the long coat raised his hand imperiously and the policeman seemed to deflate. The mysterious stranger opened his wallet, counted out a few bills, and beckoned to Stan, shoved the money in his hand. And when he began to bow in gratitude, he pointed to the door with a gesture that was imperious and unobjectionable. Thank you. Stephen grumbled goodbye. You've been so helpful. He could not forgive the betrayal of a comrade. Not even a friend, no. What had he given him up for? Twenty dollars, or a case of cheap whiskey? It would seem that after so many years of living on the streets, he should have gotten used to social Darwinism by now, but encountering it every time became so agonizing. Do you know who we are? The man in the long coat asked. His voice was calm and his gaze studied. Guessing, Stephen replied. You don't know a damn thing. Suddenly, the policeman yelled. Why don't you check in at the station? Why don't you work anywhere? That's it. You're in custody. You're coming with us. I'm not going. The homeless guy stubbornly refused. I've been in prison for seven years. You should have a warrant for my arrest. And I'm supposed to have a lawyer. I wish you'd shut up, the cop said, but in a more peaceful manner. If you knew what kind of people you've crossed. Move. I'm asking you nicely. Good for now. Otherwise, I might do something else, you understand. 
Stephen had already guessed everything. The tall man must be the husband of the fairy he had slept with the night before, and his calm exterior is just a mask. He just wants to make sure Stephen's the one he wants, and then he's gonna go for it. If he's got a cop that's so soft on him, who is it? He looks like a big shot, a shark. I'll go, Stephen said, but on one condition. You book me in right now, in the proper manner. You notify the DA, or I won't be able to vouch for myself. The cop and the man in the long coat looked at each other, but if the cop was nervous, his partner seemed satisfied. It was as if his look said, this tramp is probably just the man we need. He looked at Stephen again, hard, and smiled. It made the tramp uncomfortable. We'll do the paperwork, the cop promised. I don't know for sure what you've done, but I have to detain you. Besides, you're on probation, remember? Your cart says your last checkup was a year ago. If you get any more squeamish, I'll lock you up. They walked out of the building, and then the Mercedes caught Stephen's eye. The black car was really too good for this place. Already approaching the abandoned building, he could guess that it was a trap. It was all due to his faith in humans. Should he have trusted Stan? How long had they known each other, to be honest? You can't really have trustworthy friends on the street. Any beggar will sell out a fellow beggar. It was driven by a cop who never identified himself. But Stephen could see that it wasn't a cop's car. He touched the steering wheel too gently, took the gearbox too gently. A man in a nice coat sat in the back with Stephen and asked strange questions. Did you know your father when your mother died? Did you ever try to find out anything about your family? Stephen decided to keep quiet. I will not answer your questions without my lawyer. Cut off the beggar. And at that moment, he seemed to himself a very brave man. The station was nearby. Stephen had been there when he'd been arrested for vagrancy, but each time he'd gotten off with a minimum of indoctrination or a night in the monkey house. He didn't understand why anyone cared about his lifestyle. You'd think if he had his own corner, he'd be wandering the streets and sleeping in the basement. And if he had a job, he would be collecting bottles and waste paper. When will you formalize the detention? Stephen asked as soon as they entered the office. Silence, the policeman shouted. I'm in charge here, you understand. I need a DNA sample. You're supposed to be on file, but you're not. Somebody must have missed it. How? Stephen asked. How am I supposed to turn in the sample? Here, swipe the wand in your mouth. The cop squeamishly handed him the kind of thing you used to clean your ears with. And if I don't want to, said the beggar, looking thoughtfully at the cotton wand. You will, the cop nodded. Make it quick, I don't have much time. Stephen complied. After all, if they wanted to take samples, they could do it themselves. Better that way, of their own free will. He swiped his wand across his palate and dropped it into the bag the cop held in front of him. The cop closed it and squeamishly, with two fingers, put it in the box, sealed it. The main thing is not to catch anything from you, he said, as if poverty were a serious disease. It's what I do in the service. Every now and then I have to touch something dirty. He was taken to a separate cell. Then Stephen realized the situation and everything fell into place. If they're taking DNA samples, it's definitely rape. The fairy must have gone to the police and they're checking her story. Remorse burned inside him. He shouldn't have bought those two boxes of junk mail. He shouldn't have jumped on her like a dog on a bone. Miracles don't happen. Who knows that but Stephen? He shouldn't have approached her then. A couple days later, maybe she was frightened. And his DNA could have gotten right inside her. He'd gone crazy when he'd seen that gorgeous body. He pounced so hard he couldn't stop. The steel door of the cell opened. That's it. Get up. The policeman ordered. You're leaving. You're leaving with me. To court, Stephen asked. To the prosecutor's office. Not her. Into the woods, the cop answered and smiled. Just don't get snippy, all right? It'll be worse for you, pretty boy. Irma was literally hysterical. 
What a way for her to exact her revenge. So, there were two victims in this story, she and her family. At 25, she was ready to become a mother. And if it was just some random person, some fling at a nightclub or on a dating app, them is hurt that it happens. Some people can't get pregnant for years, they go to doctors, and some are lucky enough to get pregnant once and for all. A random person would be accepted by her family. But we're talking about a homeless man. So she, a clever and calculating woman, told Betty about it, and even sent a picture of the admirer to Paul. She wished she could rewind time, give up on this crazy plan. But it's too late. Her belly would be growing now, and in a few months it would round out and the baby would emerge from there. She looked around the apartment anxiously. No. It was definitely not suitable for children. Too many sharp corners, too drab an interior. So the apartment isn't ready for a baby, is it? After all, any woman can find herself alone with her baby. And men, even the richest, sometimes show marvels of ingenuity to leave the child and his mother without means of subsistence. Elma didn't believe in coincidences. She was a fatalist. It seemed to her that everything was already predetermined, and she, a lawyer by education and vocation, had always been an opponent of abortion. And in her scientific work, as a naive student, she proved that life begins long before breathing. When the clinic offered her a choice of two options for getting rid of an unwanted pregnancy, she decided to take time out. I need to think, she told the registrar. I need to think about it. She could hardly keep herself from weeping. She thought everyone around her knew about her tragicomedy, that she'd slept with a homeless man and gotten pregnant by him. Of course, in an expensive medical center, no one would have thought to ask her about her personal life. Shall I make an appointment for you to see a psychologist? The receptionist asked politely. This is an excellent choice for those who have doubts. You know what we're talking about, don't you? Is the psychologist a man? Irma asked. Woman, and I need a man. She screamed and ran away. It was a little childish. But when it came to abortion, she trusted only the stronger sex. She needed a sober mind, a coldness that women rarely possess. On the one hand, she understood that abortion is murder and also a risk to the health of the unwed mother. On the other, to raise a child alone, from an unnamed father. She decided to walk home on foot. Autumn was beautiful and ruddy, but nothing made her happy. Who to ask for help? Who to ask for support? There weren't many options. You could call Gregor, of course. He's got two kids of his own, a great wife. But he lives on the other side of the world. It's the middle of the night. Or, ah, daddy, Irma said into the phone, sobbing. What if your daughter, your little girl, got pregnant? Not so little, the father replied with a laugh, and his voice gave her strength. The daughter is at an age where it's time to get pregnant. Tell me, is it true? Yes, Dad. Congratulations. He brightened up. What, Paul? No, said Irma. Let it be a secret. A secret. Daddy, I'm serious, replied the girl. I will never... Never tell you who the author of the future masterpiece is. And please, tell this to mom and never ask the question again. I'm calling you about something else. She was getting ready to tell him all her doubts. That raising a child alone was difficult and hopeless. That she's still feeling young herself. That she has no family. And that a son or daughter without a father is a psychological problem in the future. But it was as if dad had guessed what she was thinking. Don't doubt it, my girl, the father said as gently as he could. I will be like a father to your son or daughter. Do you hear me? You've wanted children for a long time. Keep it and don't doubt it for a second, my dear. Together we can do this. Do you really think so? Having calmed down, Irma hung up the phone. To come to her senses, she needed to do her favorite business of planning and forecasting. She either had to renovate or move to another apartment. No, let this one stay. There is a terrace. You can go out with the baby. 
if he suddenly does not want to sleep, set up the nursery in the guest room. After all, guests will not go to her for a long time now. Try to make room for a nanny. She will go on vacation for just a little while, and then higher people or parents will take care of the baby. After all, pregnancy and childbirth is not the end of life. Rather, on the contrary, it's very beginning. Relieved, Irma sat down at her laptop and began reading articles on parenting. If she was to be a mother, she would be one of the best, if not the best. The black Mercedes was now driven by a man in a coat, and a cop sat beside him. He wasn't handcuffed, but Stephen was still uneasy. No one was answering his questions now. The men were obviously happy, both the cop and his partner. The one behind the wheel kept whispering, No way. Where are we going? Stephen asked. Why didn't you formalize my detention? Who told you you were in custody? The policeman grinned. We just invited you for a ride. Think of it as a friendly chat, a courtesy visit. But I don't want to. The homeless man was indignant, but the men only laughed. By the way, Stephen, continued the policeman, as if nothing had happened. It's been three years since you got out. Your probation's been lifted. I've prepared an excellent character reference so that no one will ever bother you again. Are you happy? Steve was silent. He was uneasy because he didn't understand what was happening. Why was it as if the deuce had been switched? Obviously, the cop was talking to him differently now. You might even say he was fawning and fawning. Besides, if they'd wanted to hurt him, they certainly would have behaved differently. Probably would have tied his hands and put him in the trunk and put a shovel on top. They did indeed come to a forest with a large estate at the foot of it. The gate opened and a black car drove into the grounds. The Mercedes approached the mansion itself, which gave the impression of a castle. What are we doing here? Stephen asked. It was nothing like the massacre in the forest he had already prepared himself for in his mind. Shut up, the cop replied. I don't know any more than you do. My job is a small one, to find you and hand you over. I don't know why they want you. And you'll, and you'll leave me to them, Stephen asked with horror. Don't worry, the policeman replied. They won't do anything to you. Or rather, you're not likely to be disappointed. Eh? Well, think about it. What else could happen to you? You're already at the bottom. There's only the grave. The car stopped near the front entrance. All three of them got out of the car, and the man in the black cloak finally addressed him. He was smiling strangely and even shuffling from foot to foot, though he gave the impression of a very confident man. My name is Clifford, he said, but you call me Cliff. Who are you? I'm Mr. John's special assistant, he explained. I'm Mr. John's special assistant, he explained. I used to be in the police force, even the Secret Service. But then, you know, I got bored. Mr. John hired me to protect him. From the enemy? Stephen asked. Worse, from friends? Be patient, you'll find out soon enough. What am I supposed to do? First things first, and shave. I'd suggest a bath as well, Cliff said. His voice was dry, colorless. The old man shouldn't be seen like that. He might have a stroke and he won't survive a second stroke. Just relax. Have you ever swam in a river? Just relax and ride the wave. All right, let's go. They entered the mansion through the front door. There were people scurrying about, probably servants. They paid no attention to Clifford and Stephen. The beggar walked on carpets, on natural parquet and stone. It seemed to him that with his dirty, worn-out shoes, he was spoiling these expensive materials, and that in a minute, he would be thrown out at best. The mansion seemed even larger from the inside than from the outside. I've already taken care of everything, Clef said. Here, come on in. They entered a large room that resembled a modern studio apartment. At one edge was a bed, high and canopied and on the other edge a shower stall of gigantic proportions. The floor was carpeted, and in the center of the room was a film spread. There was a small path leading to it. Here, Cliff said, 
Go to the center, drop your things. Then shower. There's a robe hanging there. Then a hairdresser, a barber. We've already picked out your clothes. Should I? Should I take my clothes off? Stephen asked. Don't worry, I'm not some rich pervert. Cliff smiled. I swear I'd tell you anything, but let it be an old man. I've been in the service for a hundred years, you know the rules. Just relax and let the wave carry you along, okay? Stephen exhaled and obeyed. He walked to the middle of the room and began to undress, taking off his rags, tossing them on the floor, and each new piece of clothing he threw harder and harder. It was like a caterpillar shedding its cocoon to finally become a real butterfly. After a hairdresser, a barber and a long rack of expensive clothes, Stephen didn't just feel like a different person, he became one. His gait changed, his gaze changed, his posture straightened. He walked as confidently as if he were 18 years old again. He didn't remember hoping for anything so much since then. Cliff walked behind him, and when Stephen looked back, he smiled and encouraged him. Go on, go on, I'm right here. He liked this assistant to the mysterious Mr. John more and more. They were going to get along. Maybe he'd hire Stephen and teach him everything. It seemed the rich house needed him for something, and he didn't even know what it was. As huge as the mansion was, they arrived. There was a frame at the entrance to the room that was spraying antiseptic. Cliff pulled out two medical masks. Put it on, he said. You don't have any immunizations, do you? The room was like a hospital room. It had the same sterile odor that medical facilities can boast of. As Stephen looked around the room, he didn't even immediately recognize the owner. On the bed by the window lay a thin, gaunt man, covered with tubes. Sophisticated instruments were counting his pulse. Tubes extended not only to his arms, but also to his nose, apparently to help him breathe. His gray hair was cut short. In his left ear is a small airing. Only the man's cheerful gaze made it clear that the dying man used to love life and knew how to live it. I've been looking for you for a long time, said a man connected to different tubes. Come here, come here. Stephen was silent. He approached the dying old man and stopped two meters away. The landlord gestured for another step, and another, and another, took him by the arm. Stephen felt the dry skin, as if someone had put a piece of sandpaper on his hand. The old man was warm. Your mom, the man continued, your mom gave me so much love and so much pain. What's that got to do with me? Asked Stephen. Mom's dead. I'm sorry. That was years ago, the homeless man replied. I got over it a long time ago. Although at first, frankly speaking, it was very upsetting. When I got out of prison, I couldn't wait. I only just found out, said the man and coughed. It seemed as if he was about to give his soul to God. He reached for the inhaler with his right hand and pressed the button. I just found out she was dead. And about the prison, I haven't heard about the prison, no. But good for you for not giving up. It's not that I'm in a hurry. Don't get me wrong, I really like it here with you guys. I just want to know, to what do I owe the honor, Pop? Stephen asked. Nothing, the man replied and wiped away a tear. Take off the mask, son. I really am your daddy. Dad. Stephen's eyes went wide. He sat down on the chair carefully placed beside him. That man, that hot-blooded, hot-breathing father of his. Where's he been all these years? Why did he remember him only now? Stephen experienced feelings long forgotten, joy, hope, and even love. For a moment, everything ceased to exist. That huge mansion, the servants, the expensive cars. In the whole universe, there was only this shriveled old man and Stephen. Dad, he whispered, taking off his mask. Where have you been? Oh, my boy, I'm sorry, said the dying man sentimentally. Would it be an excuse to say that they didn't tell me anything about you? Oh, your mother, God rest her soul, was too proud. Too proud. I should have been there for you. I should have saved you from jail, from the street. 
I'm so ashamed, Stephen whispered. I really am. We've only known each other five minutes, and I already feel like a jerk. He thought that if he had been in the shoes of that dying bigwig, he would have been upset to see such a son. Stephen had become a nobody, a dark shadow, an inhabitant of the bottom of life, where he had found himself of his own free will, even after he had been washed, cut, and dressed. But the old man surprisingly smiled. He who was nothing will become everything. Did you hear the socialists say that? I'm a wealthy man, he said. I'll give you everything. Education, housing. I swear I'll be with you. The man coughed again, until his last breath. What's your name, Dad? Stephen asked, stroking his beard. Barber had turned his unshaven beard into a small work of art. The former bum had gotten over his emotions and was now imagining how great it would be to spend time with his father. With his own father. John Holmes, he answered. But you call me Daddy, you understand. And don't listen to nobody. If anybody messes with you, my boy, Clifford will blow his head off. Cliff knows how to do that, but no one has to know. It'll be our secret, won't it? Clifford was laughing at the other end of the room, and Stephen was puzzled for some reason. There were too many secrets in this luxurious mansion. Irma continued to go to work and met the surprised looks of her colleagues with a smile, although it was not easy for her. Pregnancy gave her new sensations, and not only painful ones. Her hips widened, her breasts grew, her voice changed. After four months, she began to feel the baby, a girl. She was quite calm, she slept with her, and rarely reminded her of herself at night. But during the day, she could kick for many minutes at a time, but gently and not at all painfully. Irma found it funny, and she laughed every now and then. Her parents came into her life again. Both mom and dad were delighted that she wanted to keep the baby. We'll replace his father, mom said, but a gorgeous girl like you is bound to have a husband. The surprising thing was that she was no longer interested in the stronger sex at all because of her pregnancy. At times she watched Paul. He would just happen to be in the neighborhood. He looked at her belly, his gaze hardening. Irma noticed how ungainly he was. His awkward gait, his tense gestures, his tortured facial expressions. She couldn't believe she'd loved him before. When she saw him, she changed direction. She always walked away. Talk to him, Betty wrote to her. Tell him you were joking about the bum. What's that? Irma asked. When did you become that Ashol's lawyer? Children should grow up with a father, Betty went on. He says he'll take you in with someone else's child. Tell him I don't need any more handouts, and don't write to me again. Irma knew everything about Betty. She remembered laughing at her friend. She'd married early, and by the time she was 25, she'd raised two one-year-old children. Everyone knew how her husband abused her. No, not beating her or keeping her in a black body, but just humiliating her. She told her about it all the time, and that attitude drove Betty to look for love elsewhere. Wait, when did she and Paul meet? I'll be on maternity leave for only six months, Irma said, sitting in her boss's office. I give you my word that I won't let the company down. Oh, Irma, he replied. There's a big change coming, you know. We're being bought. The owners are discussing the terms of the deal now but a deal in principle has been reached. It's like they want to keep me. I'll be sure to point out that you're a valuable employee. Also, in your position, you don't want to be nervous. So take any news about reorganization with a smile. With a smile? Yeah, you have a beautiful smile. And you know what? I'm really happy for you. You're gonna be a great mom. Although his father was going to die any day now, he was still not going to go to the next world and Stephen found himself wishing he hadn't. John hardly ever got out of bed. He could only take a few steps to the window or the bathroom. He had business matters to attend to, so he couldn't spend too much time with his prodigal son. Cliff was another matter. He'd spent days with him. He helped the yesterday's vagrant not only to realize the new reality, 
but also to integrate into it. Stephen didn't even have to go anywhere. A dentist, a general practitioner, a nurse came to see him one by one. They took tests to make a conclusion. He was healthy, but vitamins were recommended. Cliff helped him to settle in and not go crazy in his new home. Your father has no children at all, he said. I'm preparing a paternity petition right now. You know what that means? No, Stephen answered honestly. That you get the proudest last name in the world, Holmes. Will I inherit his money? asked Stephen. Of course not, Cliff replied. At least it's honest. The old man had set up the foundation. In fact, he set it up a long time ago, about 30 years ago. You see, here's the thing. It's impossible to run this whole empire. Not you, not me. It'll be handled by specially trained people. And I, I'll be in charge. Missing again, Cliff smiled. There's a board of directors. You'll just be a beneficiary. No management rights. But that's for now. What am I to do? Asked Stephen. Listen to me, Cliff replied, licking his lips. You won't last a day without me. As soon as the old man leaves, they'll be all over you, believe me. Are they going to kill me? Of course not, laughed the father's assistant. They'll get you drunk. They will scatter white paths under your feet. They will pour you a sea of luxury in which you will drown. But I can see in your eyes that you're not like that. Isn't that right? Okay, Stephen nodded. I won't touch drugs. I'm only interested in girls. Young, tall, beautiful. We'll organize that, Cliff promised. Just not under the old man's nose. He doesn't like that very much. Every day Stephen had someone to tutor him. An expert in manners and communication came to see him. He taught him how to construct sentences, how to gesture, how to persuade. Thanks to him, yesterday's vagrant realized his potential. After two months, he felt like a businessman, and he was terribly eager to manage something. I don't believe you, Stephen, said the manners expert after another exercise. That's where you're not at all convinced. The main thing is that I believe in myself, you understand. And looking at the look of fear on the teacher's face, he smiled. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But you convinced me for a second, didn't you? I wouldn't recommend using such crude methods. That's not what I'm teaching you, Mr. Stephen. He was tutored by a teacher in finance, the basics of law, and he also learned German and business analysis. He liked to study. He also liked wandering the corridors of the mansion, looking at the portraits of his distant relatives, reading books in the library. That's how they live, the rich. They have everything and they can't get enough. And now he was one of them. The labor went surprisingly well. Irma had heard so many horror stories about what happens to moms and babies. She was afraid to go to the delivery table, but money works wonders, and even before the first contractions, all her fears disappeared thanks to the support of the staff. After the labor, she felt exhausted and happy at the same time. Now she was a mother. When a baby girl was placed on her chest, Irma blossomed. It didn't matter who had fathered the child. God had given her a daughter, no other way. Only in that moment did she feel the emptiness of her soul filled by children. And now she would look at men with even less trust. Could her future husband be a father to the child? Congratulations, smiled the midwife. Three kilograms exactly 50 centimeters. A very big girl. Thank you, Irma replied. She could feel her strength leaving her. You're going to rest now. We'll take care of the girl. Just be careful, okay? Irma asked. Of course, replied the midwife. We treat children as if they were our greatest asset. You need to rest, do you hear? Yes, of course. She was taken to the room on a comfortable gurney that ran like a boat on the waves. The nurses gently laid her on the bed and covered her with a blanket. They immediately connected sensors to her arms to measure her blood pressure pulse, and other parameters. Next to her, on a table, was her cell phone. Can I give you a sedative? The nurse obligingly offered, to make your sleep more restful and deeper. No, no, 
she whispered. I feel fine, as good as can be. I'll share the news with my family, and then I'll go to sleep. Okay. The worker replied, walked out of the room, and carefully closed the door. At that moment, she even regretted that her father had paid for the top-end services. She wouldn't mind lying with other women in labor now, sharing her emotions. She picked up her phone and texted her father, her mom, her friends that she had an adorable daughter. Feeling energized, she decided to read the messages on Messenger. A message from Betty caught her eye. Irma, call me now. They're looking for you, you hear? They say Holmes himself is looking for you. He had a nightmare. It was cold outside, winter had begun, and his woolen socks had been stolen, and he wandered the streets with cold feet, risking frostbite on his toes. All the cafes were closed, and behind the panoramic windows, there were customers, and they laughed at his grief. He wakes up. He's lying in his own room in his father's mansion. He forgot to turn off the air conditioner, and a faint stream of cool air drifted down his legs. The poverty, the street, the garbage, it was all in the past. That was the scary dream, and now he was awake. Now he would hold on to this reality with hands, teeth, and feet. He would never touch drugs or alcohol, and he would never trust anyone. Stephen could not escape the feeling that the chain of these processes had been set in motion by a fairy, whose name he didn't even know. However, why not make inquiries? With his new powers, it would be such a trifle. He marked it for Cliff. He taught him how to take notes, so he wouldn't miss an important thought. Today was a special day. Today he would be introduced to the board as the new beneficiary. Cliff had told him all about the people who were now feeding off his father's company, and how it was vital that they seize the initiative, humiliate Stephen, and discourage him from managing. Look at this, the deputy told me. Alberta's in charge. It's just a man in a skirt. She controls all the financial flows, directs. She's a very smart woman, but she's not very nice. Her right-hand man is Victor, a man as flexible as can be. He will pretend that everything is fine, that everything is fine, but in fact he will play his own game. Are they the ones I need to be wary of? Asked Stephen. And not just them, Cliff replied. Then there's Mr. Anthony. He's dreaming of taking Alberta's place. We'll use him. But later, Clifford suggested not wasting time, but trying to take the initiative. Hire auditors, check every dime that went through the accounts. His father's company wasn't a one-size-fits-all operation. The old man had invested skillfully in many different areas. And now the money was making money in trading, car manufacturing, the information market. Huge currents are closing in on the three of them, Cliff said. If you don't show them who's boss, they'll be all over you. Yesterday's conversation had scared Stephen for some reason. He thought the rich never had any problems. They didn't have to drag themselves through the streets, collecting bottles and paper to make ends meet. Turns out the rich have their own pains and fears. The main one being losing everything. The horror that he might be back on the street again made him breathless. Stephen caught himself thinking that he wanted to discuss the matter with Sebastian's personal psychologist, and then he was afraid that Alberta had hired him, and he would be sharing information about his mental state with her. You can't trust anyone, not even Cliff. Though he'd almost convinced Stephen of his loyalty. With his father gone, yesterday's drifter would be all alone again. He dialed the nurse's internal number. It was 6.30 on the clock, the time Dad usually woke up. Maybe he could find a few minutes for him. Cindy, honey, Stephen said. I've longed so much for my father's company. Good morning, answered the nurse. Stay on the line, I'll be right there to ask. Of course. Yesterday's homeless man, and now the heir to a sonorous surname, did not recognize himself. It seemed to him that someone else had taken over his body. A rich and successful young man who had a great sense of people, and even seven years in prison now seemed like a bad joke. No, this wasn't about him. He had spent his whole life here, in this luxurious mansion, 
radiating success. Mr. John is waiting, the nurse replied. Stephen immediately pulled disposable gloves and a mask from his desk drawer. He rushed out into the hallway because his father's room was a good distance away. He stopped in front of it, applied antiseptic to his hands, stood under the atomizer. If he wanted his father to live a little longer, he had to keep him healthy. Good morning, Dad, he said. Stevie, come in, smiled his father. Come here, I have something important to tell you. I've decided to make a change in the management structure of the foundation. Irma wasn't going to answer Paul's calls and texts, and he seemed to be taking drastic measures. His boss called, and while congratulating him, he mentioned in passing that their company had been bought. He was being fired, but Irma was being kept. Now we will, you are part of the R's3 holding company, he said bitterly. It's been a pleasure working with you, Irma. By the way, I'm going to open my own little office here. Don't you want to join me? The young mom remained silent and didn't answer anything to the proposal. She was not going to leave the beautiful office and start her own business. No way. She wouldn't quit. And besides, people like her should be kept first and foremost. She politely said goodbye to her former boss and told him she would miss him. The first weeks with the baby were not easy. My daughter woke up every two to three hours and demanded to be fed. On the doctor's advice, Irma switched to artificial milk almost immediately, and she never regretted it. It took only a couple of minutes to prepare the formula, but she could eat whatever she wanted without restricting herself. Irma, we're so happy. Mom was delighted. Maybe you can tell us who the baby's daddy is. Honey, I told you. Dad interrupted. You and I agreed not to ask Irma questions like that. When the joy of motherhood dulled a little, Irma suddenly felt sorry for her little girl. She would grow up like that without a father, and she could hardly tell her the secret of who her father was. After all, the child's psyche might not be able to withstand such information. The main thing now that no one found out her secret. First, she had to completely cut out those who had that information from her social circle. She blocked Betty and over time found new friends. They were all young moms just like her. They would gather around the block, wheeling their babies on gurneys and sharing the progress of how their babies were eating and egg-duking. She was not going to go to work until the baby was six months old. Irma could do some things from home. She monitored corporate email and kept track of the company's affairs. Work went on as usual. There were no fewer clients after the reorganization. When she returned to the office, she would easily fit into all the processes. The only thing that was confusing was the new boss. She hadn't even met the boss who would be in charge of her. What if he was young and handsome? What if he wanted more than just an executive? At some point, she decided to find out what this R's three holding company was all about. The company turned out to have deep roots. Founded as a family business, it quickly grew. More and more new areas were taken over by the business. The founder had a commercial flair and immediately understood where money should be invested. After only 15 years, everyone had to reckon with this capital. No wonder they wanted to buy the law firm where she worked. But then the last name caught Ilma's eye, and a longing settled in her soul. Not even her daughter's smile could dispel it. Would she be able to find herself in a team headed by a man with the surname Holmes? Clifford exulted. He had succeeded perfectly in presenting Stephen as Mr. John's heir. With a new surname, it would not be easy to dig into the depths of the former beggar's biography and the hare himself easily got rid of street manners and Moore gave the impression of the hair of a wealthy family. Although Clifford helped prepare the speech, Steve spoke impromptu. If anything is going to change with me, it will be for the better, the young man said. His voice was firm, though his hands were restless with worry. We will keep our father's business and try to increase all that he has worked so hard to create. Mr. Stephen came Alberta's voice. She was pulling her vowels in a very nasty way. Do you know that he who does not grow dies? He who does not move freezes. 
Known, Holmes Jr. replied, known as much as anyone, but we will move very carefully and grow slowly. And if anyone disagrees with my vision of the future, let them speak now or shut up forever. There was no one willing to argue. All the top managers had their own sources of knowledge. They all knew very well where Stephen had spent the last 10 years of his life. So they were ready to see a fallen, fallen man. Holmes's hair gave the opposite impression. Looking at him, prison time and wandering the streets could well be mistaken for PR if he was going into politics. At the banquet on the occasion of Stephen's introduction, there was a sumptuous table with treats. The new beneficiary of the foundation, however, did not sit at the most beautiful chair, but preferred to communicate with the new team on his feet. He ate little and drank only pure water. He seemed to be interested in everything. Do you really think this direction is promising? He asked the head of the strategic planning department. Oh yes, he replied, and immediately adjusted to the new boss, but we're not taking any chances. We'll go gradually, as they say, at low speed. It's the right thing to do. Like a shadow, Stephen was followed by Clifford. He smiled as he looked at Mr. John's successor. This one wouldn't let him down, that's for sure. Of course, there was still much to teach him. And the most important thing was that he should retain that grain of distrust and apprehension. Without it, the boy won't last long in this business. Let's drink. Alberta approached Stephen with a huge bottle of champagne in her hand to the success of the firm. Bottoms up. Shall we drink? Mr. Holmes asked the new Mr. Holmes. Gentlemen, I have a toast. He shouted and raised the bottle above his head. When a ship was launched in Britain, a bottle of expensive champagne was smashed against the stern. I believe this custom is obsolete. Therefore, this luxurious drink that Mrs. Alberta offered me will auction it off. A charity auction. And whatever the auction house raises, I'll multiply it by two. I think my father will support me. Standing over the solid wood coffin, Stephen had conflicting feelings. On the one hand, his father was finally done for. Every day of his life had been difficult for him lately. It was obvious how his father was suffering and suffocating. On the other hand, they had spent so little time together. All he could do now was to keep his memory alive. Not to squander, but to increase his inheritance. I'm sorry, said another person who came to the last farewell and shook hands. There were more than a hundred of them. Stephen was already tired of thanking everyone for these words. It seemed to him that there were no sincere people here, that all of them, one way or another, would want a piece of the financial pie left by his father. And when the assistant appeared next to him and offered to step aside, Stephen was glad. At least he could trust this man, and his condolences were indeed sincere. I tracked her down, Clifford said, and held out a folder as they retreated to a separate room. Here's the full dossier. Who? wondered Holmes Jr. That girl you asked for, the assistant replied. Do you remember the morning you took office? Oh yes. What do you think? Stephen yawned. He didn't want to show his interest. 27 years old, unmarried, never been married. One year old child, paternity not officially established. Very positive and extremely positive girl from a successful family. That's how it is, Steve replied. You know, she was very kind to me, back then. You know. He avoided talking about his past directly. And the years of living on the streets became a succinct, when? Of course, nodded Cliff. I understand perfectly. I wish I could get a meeting with her. That's easy, the assistant said. She works for your company. Or I mean our company. Shortly before he died, the old man decided to get involved in corporate law for some reason. She's a senior specialist in one of the departments, just got out of maternity leave. Can you imagine? Although Irma's maternity leave was short, returning to work was still a challenge. It was as if she had been born again. In the short year she had been away, everything had changed, not just the boss. However, Thanks to her organizational skills, 
she had quickly gotten things under control. Although Ilma had expected trouble, knowing that Paul's family had bought out the company, everything was fine. Rumor had it that they were controlled by the heir to John Holmes himself, though for years it was believed he had no children. Irma didn't bother to delve into her ex's genealogy. Even her father was considered a poor man against their background. However, she was less interested in money now. After all, she now had her daughter as her main treasure. She named her Sophia, and she was very fond of her. The baby pleased her. She ate well, slept, held her head, and tried to stand on her feet. From the first days of life at night, almost did not bother her. During the day, she stayed with the nanny or her parents without any problems. Irma, dear, said Chris, her senior colleague. Here's the thing. Go ahead, she replied. He must want to ask her out for a cup of coffee or a movie. She'd noticed his interest in her for a long time. Anyway, he's calling you, himself. Who? Yourself. The girl wondered. Holmes himself. I don't know why he's interested in you. Paul, thought Irma. What a proud man. He could have forgotten about her long ago and gone on with his life. But no, he was not lazy and persuaded his family to buy the company. And now here he is, showing up. All right, Irma replied. When is he expecting me? Right now, Chris shrugged. In the principal's office. The girl went up to the top floor of the office. From there, she had a pretty good view of the neighborhood. But all in all, it was nothing special. Paul had certainly surprised and disappointed her. He could have just said whatever he wanted to say. But he doesn't know how to do that. Never mind. Let him be hysterical. She'd love to see it. Mr. Holmes, she asked innocently, entering the hallway without knocking. But instead of Paul, a completely different man was sitting there. He nodded and smiled and pointed to the chair opposite. Have a seat, the big boss suggested. He was young and handsome though, and also subtly reminded me of her Paul. The director has kindly given me his office for 10 minutes, so let's not waste time. You've been recommended to me as an experienced and efficient worker. It is, she said. If you ask me what I see myself as in five years, I'm sorry, I don't have much time to talk, he cut her off. I just wanted you to submit your resume for the office manager position. What? Irma choked with embarrassment. But you see, I have a small child. I'm aware of that, replied Holmes. By the way, where did the name Irma come from? I like it a lot. Oh, it's father. The girl began, but the chief immediately interrupted her. I'm sorry, I already know the answer to that question, he said. We met with your father last week. His architectural firm will be designing a shopping center for us. I've decided to go in that direction too. Oh, my father. She started, but she had to stop talking again. The phone rang. I'm sorry. Holmes apologized and started typing some kind of message. Urgent business. But you know what? I'm free after nine o'clock. I could have coffee with you and... Always interrupting. Irma asked resentfully. In fact, she didn't have time to be really offended. I swear I'll keep quiet, he smiled. It's just that all the deadlines are burning up during the day. And with them, good manners. I'm having trouble finding a resource as it is. I'm babysit in the evenings, Irma replied. But I could leave my daughter with a babysitter. Or, you know what? Yes, Stephen asked. Maybe you want to come to my place. The girl suddenly blushed at her insolence and naivety. I understand that you are a busy man, but why not have coffee at my place? Good idea. The big boss suddenly agreed. Just write me the address and time. My driver will bring me back minute by minute. By the way, have we met? Have we met anywhere? Irma asked, writing down the address on a piece of paper. She had heard the man's voice for the first time, but some of his features seemed familiar. I have no idea, Stephen replied, accepting the leaflet. Aha, so eight o'clock at night. That's a great time. I look forward to our meeting. Me too. 
Irma Schoen. Okay, I'm going to write my resume. See you soon, boss. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.